I would like to call the Committee of the Whole meeting to order and welcome the members of the public who are joining us in the gallery and online. Um, we would like to, um, as we grow and learn, the WRDSB is working to recognize days of secular, religious, and creed-based observances and holidays and schedule board and committee meetings accordingly. As such, the Board of Trustees are meeting this evening rather than the past Monday in order to acknowledge the staff, students, and families who celebrated Orthodox Easter on Monday. This is ongoing work, and while we may not get it right every time, we will continue to strive to learn and continue to do better so we are more inclusive. On behalf of the Board, I wish to wish, would like to wish a happy Easter to the Orthodox Christian community and a happy Easter to everyone who celebrated Easter earlier this month. I would also like to say Ramadan Mubarak to all our community, community members who are continuing to observe the month of fasting. We know that Eid is fast approaching, and to the Muslim families we serve, an early Eid Mubarak. Today, some of our trustee members will be breaking their fast, so we will have a 15-minute recess at approximately 8.05, so that they can do so and be included in any further conversations that will be happening at the table. As the director is also fasting, the director will step out to break the fast, and at that time, Associate Director Scott Miller will assume responsibilities of the director until the director returns. For any members of the gallery who may be observing the fast, please note that at this time, uh, at 8.05, when we take our break, you are able to step out should you need to do so, and there is a designated quiet space should you require it, and the security can assist you in locating it. So thank you for that, and please rise if you are able for O Canada. Okay, trustees, would somebody like to move approval of the agenda? Moved by Trustee Woodcock, seconded by Trustee Radman. Um, can we just pause one second? I can't see the Can we get the virtual attendees on the screen as well, please? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so moved by Trustee Woodcock, seconded by Trustee Radlin. All in favor? Okay, and opposed? And the agenda is approved. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing them, uh, celebrating board activities and announcements. Um, I have regrets from student trustee Reina. Um, and I have a few announcements that I guess I'll begin and then I'll go around the table because I think there's a few this evening. 
So on uh, April 15th, I, along with trustees Radlin, Piotowski, Woodcock, Cody, and student, um, student trustees Reina and Sora attended the mayor, oh, and Associate Director Schantz attended the mayor's dinner. Um, the dinner honored the work of the Working Center and other organizations working to support people without homes. Um, a better tent city and our support of our neighbors was mentioned. And it was a lovely night that raised uh, money for important organizations doing great work in our community. Um, it is scholarship and awards season, and I would like to congratulate student trustee Sora for winning the Sonata Young People, Young Women in Public Affairs Award. So congratulations to her. Uh, student from Cameron Heights, Ellen Brisley, uh, won the Loren Award, which is a $100,000 scholarship given annually to 36 high school students from across Canada. Uh, through the Loren Scholars Foundation, it is a very competitive um, scholarship process, so I want to congratulate her. And of course, uh, there's lots of students that we don't hear about uh, that are winning great awards and scholarships across our board, so I want to congratulate each and every one of them um, for all of their hard work in getting those. And finally, I'll just share that uh, yesterday I was pleased to have the opportunity to visit Julie McKay's de-streamed grade nine science class at Cameron Heights. It was great to see and enjoy uh, the engagement of the students that uh, as they worked together, as they did a combined lesson of electricity and coding that I will admit some went over my head. It was really, really great work. The teacher was constantly in motion, uh, guiding individual students through their learning. So I would just like to thank Julie and Alida Klassen and to the students who answered my many questions and showed me how they were getting through their work. Uh, they were amazing hosts. So thank you for that. And now I will uh, look for other announcements. Anyone? Trustee Cody? Do you oh, want to go first? Sure. Um, I was pleased to uh, go with Trustee Carla Johnson and uh, Supervisor Vita Colas, and I did my first two school visits. Uh, first one set the pace for the day. I got to go to my old high school, GCI, and it was uh, a great, wonderful feeling walking through those front doors after, I'm not going to tell you how many years. <laughs> and then I was able to call my, my old locker, my old whole room, and then the principal's office. <laughs> uh, it was great to walk down those lovely halls, see the history of Tassie Hall, and seeing the classrooms filled with files and students hard at work. Then off the PHS, which is a school that I terrorized when I was a younger man. Uh, it was great to see a small school with all the additions and all the work, and uh, the staff and the principal there doing a fine job. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, no cell phone policy that they had worked through. It was a student's idea, yeah. which was amazing. Uh, it was a wonderful day, and I'm looking forward to doing more. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Trustee Johnson? Yeah, thank you. And to jump off, yeah, just get ahead from that. Um, since our last board meeting, which was on the 27th of March, I have been able to visit eight schools, eight great school visits. So um, two of them were, were with Trustee Cody, and that was such a that was such a fun day, those stairs at GCI. <laughs> um, and on March the 28th, I was at William G. Davis Senior Public School with the Razorbacks. I am a former William G. mom, so and my child absolutely loved their time there. The day we visited, we got to see the robotics club, we walked around the cafetorium, and we spent a little extra time singing with the School of Rock students. And then on March the 30th, we, I was able to go to visit St. Andrews Senior Public Schools, the Spartans. I used to teach there, and I, I love going up to see my old room on the top floor and reconnecting with the mm -hmm. staff. Um, I spent some time looking at the challenges that many schools are facing, trying to retrofit them to make them accessible and getting elevators installed. Very big challenge in these older schools. Then on March the 30th, I was at Southwood um, Secondary School, spending some time with the Sabres. It was my first time at Southwood. So I just love being in the building and seeing seeing what's going on there. A lot of work being done by the drama and music classrooms, um, especially making it for a lot of setbacks in the last few years. Um, and so many great things happening in the motorsports room. On March the 30th, 31st, I started my day with the Jacob Hespler Secondary School Hawks. There are a multitude of top class programs going on there. They have a beautiful sports weight room. They've got a well-appointed ace classroom, the band and the choir, uh, the guitar classrooms and the stained glass artwork throughout the school. 
I have to say, we are the day we went to Preston too. I'm a Preston mom, so I'm a former Preston mom. So I love reconnecting with the staff and all these crucial people that help my child um, at these key points in their life. Uh, April 11th, I went to Central Public School to visit with the Wolf Pack. I had never been in that building either. I used to live in that neighborhood. Uh, it's a special building with very thoughtful architecture. And there's a very warm, welcomely library that is right in the central to the life of the school. The halls were full of colorful, vibrant student art. And then we got to meet some students who were so proud of their reading skills. Now, I want to, I'm mentioning Glen, on March the 31st, I went to Glenview Park Secondary School and visited with the Panthers. And uh, I have to say, I was inspired to see the various departments, how they were working together really creatively from the tech department to the food services, to the music. They're all working together as a real family. They have, they even have chicken and sheep at, their, at the school. And um, I, um, I want to say a special thank you to Glenn Booker. He's the head of tech studies there. They had a uh, trade fair and expo um, back in February that took over a hundred person hours to plan it. And over a third of the student body showed up for this trade fair. And I want to just take a moment to share that with you. I'll have some final thoughts at the end of the slideshow, but I want to share um, Glenview Park Secondary School Trade um, Trade and Fair Expo, as you can see on the screen. Take just a few moments to look at that. This is their first annual. Speakers, exhibit, sample timetable. We went till after the school day was over. Kids stayed right through. The speakers. You can see all the areas covering bricklayer, chef, sheet metal, horticultural, high style, hairstylists, etc. The kids engaged in workshops. Booths were set up. All the all the community and the hospitality students were prepared to. Mm -hmm. so, so many guests were brought in from the community. It's a phenomenal day and a great success for, for Glenview Park. I want to say I'm looking forward to visiting Elgin Street Public Schools tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Several other schools have reached uh, friends at other schools have reached out asking me to visit their schools. Please know I am on it. <laughs> My goal is to visit every WRDSB school in Cambridge and Air at some point. Thank you to the principals and vice principals who took time out of their busy days to host the visit. Thank you to the teachers and education workers who shared their wonderful work. It was so fun to reunite with some of my former colleagues uh, and to Superintendent Collis and Fedestoff who are facilitating these wonderful and inspiring visits. Now, please know this, every moment of every day, there are a multitude of beautiful things happening in our schools. It is the generous kindness, professionalism, and passion of our teachers, education workers, and admin staff that make our schools special. Our schools are staffed with people clearly dedicated to going the extra distance to meet the needs of our students. It is my honor to shine a light on them today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, hey, Trustee Woodcock. Uh, mine's very brief and not near as um, good as that. <laughs> um, on March 29th, um, I and several other trustees, uh, Trustee Ramsey, Trustee Radlin, uh, Trustee Piakowski, Chairperson Watt, uh, Weston, woo, woo, Weston, <laughs> and Trustee Cody, Trustee Meisner, and myself, we all attended the uh, PSS personnel, PSFP gathering at the Bar Kitchen, the social event reception. It was lovely to uh, get to know people and um, meet them. That uh, PSSP group, the Professional Student Services Personnel, is made up of communicative disorders assistants, psychological consultants, social workers, and speech and language pathologists. And uh, it was a great event to meet people, find out where they're at, what they're doing in the schools. And I just wanted to make sure they got uh, mentioned. Wonderful, thank you. Um, are there any other announcements? Okay, seeing none, um, we um, are moving trustee, on to, oh, okay, sorry, Trustee yeah, Wazim, I didn't see your hand, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say Trustee uh, Piotrowski's um, hand has been up. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, okay, Trustee Wazim, you don't have an announcement this time? Okay, great. Trustee Piotrowski? 
Uh, yes, thank you. And apologies, uh, Zoom is not recognizing my camera tonight. So essentially, I'm uh, I'm just uh, audio, uh, and I will vote uh, and um, and indicate my wish to speak by raising my virtual hand. Um, so I wanted to uh, to just uh, note that uh, uh, Vice Chair Woodcock, uh, Trustee uh, Radlin, Trustee Johnson, and myself attended the uh, Central West uh, Regional Caucus of OPSPA uh, in Guelph, uh, our, our neighboring board, and uh, there were representatives of Hamilton Wentworth and uh, and the host board and uh, and the Halton board uh, there as well. And it was a good opportunity to uh, to discuss uh, the progress of uh, OPSPA's strategic plan and uh, and those those priorities. And uh, as as well, just to uh, reflect on the uh, the common uh, challenges faced by all boards, and uh, certainly as uh, as we host uh, the uh, regional meeting in the fall, I would encourage uh, fellow trustees to take advantage of the opportunity to attend and network. Okay, thank you, Trustee Pytowski. Seeing no other announcements now, uh, we will move on to delegations. Um, I will let trustees know that uh, Ms. Uh, Sashrada, Sashradi has uh, sent regrets for this evening. So we have uh, six delegations. So I will ask uh, Ms. Rydell to bring in uh, the first virtual um, delegation and I will read the delegation procedures. Ready? Okay. Mr. Hayway, Hayway, can you hear me? You can give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Okay, so I will read the delegation procedures. In accordance with the board's bylaw, delegations have up to 10 minutes to address the board. Any exception to this rule require a majority vote. All remarks are to be confined to the issue you are addressing and discourteous language, reference to personalities or statements contravening the Ontario Human Rights Code or the Charter of Rights and Freedoms will not be tolerated. At the beginning of your presentation, the timer will be set for 10 minutes. When nine minutes have passed, I will advise you that you have one minute remaining to bring your comments to a close. Following each presentation, trustees will have an opportunity to ask only questions of clarifications relating to your remarks. If the item you are addressing is listed on the agenda, then trustees will discuss the matter at the appropriate time. If your issue is not listed on the agenda, then trustees may opt to present a motion to refer it to staff for follow-up or request that it be included on a future meeting agenda or add the item to the meeting agenda, which would require a two-thirds vote of trustees present to vote in favor of adding to the agenda. Okay. Did you, were you able to hear all of that? I was, great. yes. Okay, great. And you have uh, no presentation this evening, so you can begin when you are ready. Thank you. I want to quickly thank everyone uh, for agreeing to hear with me uh, and speak with me today. I apologize I couldn't make it in person. Uh, some members of my family got sick, so I am here like this. Uh, truth is, I, I don't know, um, truthfully, if this is going to make a large difference after the decisions that have already been made and announced uh, for, the, um, for the French immersion curriculum coming up. Uh, is going to um, is going to make any difference at all if I'm speaking to this tonight. However, I would uh, I would like to speak on it. Uh, the implications of it and the changes um, not only to uh, to the curriculum but also the impact of what I can see as a very ill-advised decision that has been made and just released by the board. Um, the the overall answer is that this week alone uh, I witnessed uh, just going to pick up my sons from school, kids sitting on the elementary school playground during physical education classes. Uh, my sons told me that there is no longer a soccer team, no football team, no teams during lunch or after school, no clubs, nothing. Nothing that I myself experienced or that anyone else has experienced pre the COVID pandemic. Yet at a Rhapsody meeting today, or uh, sorry, this month, earlier this month, actually, I, uh, I listened to a representative of the teachers union talk about the return uh, of, of students coming back from classes after the pandemic. They spoke of disciplinary issues, social anxiety, lack of critical thinking, emotional acceptance, lack of empathy, lack of inclusion, etc. And I couldn't help but in this time relating to the pandemic and everything else, speaking to the changes in the um, French immersion curriculum where 
the math and sciences will be pulled out of out of French, and instead, the uh, subjects of music and physical education, etc., will be put into the French immersion stop. This is a common factor that. Uh, I, I challenge you on because the arts itself is the cornerstone of not only good habits, releasing disciplinary issues, social anxiety, it helps in critical thinking. Studies have proven that it helps ex emotional acceptance, emotional intelligence, lack of empathy is turned around. It's, it promotes and holds developmental spatial awareness, critical thinking, problem solving, reinforces language skills, etc. The overall options, including, uh, including improving mood and improving coordination, enhancing auditory skills and more, are going to be suffering when you are not allowed to teach that in a language that is then understood and communicated. That is ignoring the fact that in many schools, music teachers are actually music trained teachers. And luckily enough, in my son's elementary school, the music educator there is the trained music teacher. Studies have shown that uh, studies across Europe and the U.S. as well have shown that over 45 percent of music teachers do not want teachers that are not specialized teaching education in music, that over 72 percent of teachers that are not specialized in music are not comfortable teaching the music or other arts, and over 80 percent of them have an issues teaching it when it becomes specialized to instrumental study, etc. The issue I'm having here is that we're dealing with a pandemic return where all these issues are known and we take away the few courses that bring together these kids through band, through other things, through music videos and all other options. In a presentation to Rapsi in February, a Waterloo Record reporter talked about the French immersion course on the whole and said, that the French immersion issue in his mind sits in the core that people are signing up thinking it makes them bilingual or it's where the smart kids go. My question for the trustees today is why are instructions on courses taught in other languages not parents in both languages? Why are they not using online options to send the instructions for homework for their kids in math or science to the parents, why just teach math in English? The answer I know already is they, the grades went down. So what you're saying is that you can afford for the grades and the arts to go down as long as the arts program isn't as important as balancing a checkbook. Why is balancing a checkbook more important than developing a well-rounded and intellectual growth of all students? Studies have proven that over 60% of doctors graduating in 2019, 2020, out of med schools in Canada, studied music from a young age. So what we've proven now is that we're going to have math in English and science in English. They're going to know everything about it, but they're going to have absolutely no sense of culture because of the lack of quality of education going on in these schools. I'm challenging as to why the WRDSB in their own reports say that they want equity, inclusion, enhancements, and all other options to be included in school culture and why they push it so importantly, but then they remove the one kind of course that bring English language speaking and the French immersion curriculums together. It's a misquoted quote, and I'm just going to end on this one. Winston Churchill gets the quote, but it's not actually him who did it. It was one of his generals. And they asked him in the war, why are the symphonic players not here? Why are the actors still acting? And why are the artists still drawing? The general turned and said, what do you think we're in the war for? The underlying message of that is the culture. It is who we are. If we don't reverse this course, and invest in education, in music education, in arts, in phys ed, in other options, there is no way that we're going to improve the quality of education. All we're going to do is have bankers on the floor who know how to balance a checkbook, but have absolutely no social anxiety, have, are full of social anxiety and absolutely no skills. 
I do thank the board for their time today. And I really hope that developing young minds goes beyond that of math and science. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Hayway, for your delegation. Trustees, are there any questions of clarification? Trustee Watson? I don't have a question, but I'd like to forward um, his concerns, the delegation's concerns to staff so that they're able to answer his question. So you're asking to refer to staff to for his question his questions to be answered. Yeah. Okay, just want to clarify. Uh, is there a seconder? Trustee Ramsey? Any questions or on that? Comments? No? Okay. Move to a vote. Trustees, uh, there's been a motion to uh, request that this be referred to staff so the delegates questions can be answered. All in favor? Three, four, five, six. Okay. And opposed? Okay, so that is not a majority and that is not carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hayway, for your delegation this evening. You will be uh, removed from the uh, Zoom call, and but you're welcome to watch the rest of the meeting on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Morley? And I believe you have a presentation, is that correct? Yes. Okay. We'll just pause for a moment while Ms. Rydell gets that started. Okay, great, whenever you're ready. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Susan Morley. I have been employed as a teacher by the WRDSB since 1993. I am deeply passionate about my most recent assignment, teaching music and the performing arts at Westville Public School. Next slide. I assumed my current position in 2015 with the sole purpose of building a performing arts program. And I am pleased to say that music and the performing arts are alive and well, not only at Westvale, but also in many schools across the region, thanks to our dedicated and qualified music educators. Next slide. I am here tonight to represent the voices of many of my colleagues being music teachers, as well as core French and French immersion teachers alike. In these last 30 years, I have witnessed more changes in the education system than I can possibly count. I have also witnessed extensive changes in our student populations. We are more diverse than ever with multiple ethnicities, cultures, and languages being represented in a single class. In addition, I have seen an increase in learning needs with students who demonstrate various learning disabilities. Teachers are faced with ever-changing working conditions, expectations, and demands. They have to be flexible and willing to change in order to adapt to the ever-changing world in which we live. Next slide. Now educators are facing another change, one that we are struggling to reconcile. Many educators throughout the region were shocked and saddened by the decision the board has made in regards to French instruction for the coming school year. We struggle to understand the changes to our roles as educators, and we are concerned for the impact this may have on our students. We also struggle with the timing of these changes. The board's decision was made in June of 2022, yet teachers were not informed of the specific changes and how they would drastically alter our teaching assignments until January 27th of this year. Parents and caregivers learned about the plans through school day on March 21st. Considering the scope of the changes, teachers are concerned that they may not have the time or resources to adequately prepare. Next slide. One of the most significant impacts of the new French immersion delivery model is the change in the language of instruction from English to French in music and the performing arts. In addition, French immersion will begin in grade two. All grade one students will see an increase in French from five periods to eight periods per cycle, leaving grade one teachers with French as their only option for planning time coverage. The results of these changes displaces many music educators who will be reassigned to teach subjects they haven't taught in years 
or perhaps decades. The purpose of my delegation is to advocate for the best possible education for students, which I believe includes a solid grounding in the performing arts, and even more specifically music, of all the subjects students will study in their lifetime, including math. Music is the only one that actively engages all the parts of the brain and improves learning in the other core subject areas. It is also a subject in which most students achieve high rates of success. It is rare to see a student who needs an IEP in music. Good music instruction delivered by a knowledgeable music educator can enhance a child's learning in school in ways that are immeasurable. Next slide. This is what we know about music. Number one, it is a language which requires informed teaching practices as well as a particular skill set. Number two, it is integral in social emotional learning and in rebuilding from traumatic events such as a pandemic. And number three, it is a vital part of school spirit, culture, and community. Core classroom teachers, both English and French immersion, work tirelessly to master multiple subjects with steadily changing curriculums and pedagogical strategies. They manage the constant pressure to meet provincial standards and standardized testing in math and language, and they devote their time and energy to excel in the teaching of these subjects. In the fall, many of these teachers will now need to teach music and the performing arts in French. Additional time and funding will be needed to develop appropriate resources in French for these subjects. Meanwhile, those of us who have specialized in the arts will be assigned to teach other subjects. Next slide. We know that the ministry does not recognize primary and junior music to be a specialized subject. Grade one to six teachers are certified to teach all subjects. Therefore, teachers who are passionate and experienced in the arts are not considered specialists. Please consider that music is a specialized language that often requires years of study and practice to understand and to master, let alone to teach. Those of you who learned how to play an instrument to sing or to sing in a choir most likely did so under the careful guidance of a qualified music teacher. Placing music instruction in the hands of someone with no musical background, training, or passion is beneficial to no one. On the other hand, it increases the stress and workload of core classroom teachers and robs students of the specialized instruction they deserve. Many students in our region learn music at school and only at school, as many families cannot afford private music lessons. The students in our board who are fortunate enough to have music lessons outside of school greatly benefit when there is consistency between the language they are learning in school and the language they are learning in their private lessons. Those connections, which enhance a child's overall learning and experience, will be lost when we add the barrier of another language. Music is a language of notation and terminology, which is in Italian, requiring specialized training in order to read and understand. One look at our music curriculum document, one will quickly see that music is indeed a specialized language. Next slide. Rhythm, for example, is only one of the six elements of music in the curriculum. Fundamental concepts for the element of rhythm in grade three are sixteenths and dotted half notes. In grade four, syncopated rhythms. In grade five, dotted quarters, followed by eights, dotted eights, followed by sixteenths, various combinations of eights and sixteenths. In grade six, compound meters, pick up notes, triplets. Those of you who with limited background or training in music might not have understood anything I just said. <laughs> Rather, you might have thought you were sitting in math class, taking mm -hmm. in a, a lesson on fractions. You cannot ignore the obvious connections between music and math. Now that math has been moved to English for our French immersion students, does it not make sense to keep music and English where the learning in these subjects clearly complement each other? We have the resources available with highly qualified music teachers. Why not use them to their fullest capacity and offer our students the best music education and experience possible? Next slide. Our current high school music programs depend on adequate enrollments in order to survive. Our region is blessed with amazing high school music programs that are thriving because of the strength of our elementary music programs. These high school programs are built on the foundation that is laid in the early years, a foundation that consists of the love of music, an understanding of basic music skills and concepts, and confidence. Next slide. In addition, music can change the course of a child's day and even his or her life. Our kids have survived a pandemic, or have they? Next slide. Mental health issues are rising. We see debilitating anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and suicidal ideation. Lethargy, apathy, anger, and aggression are now common. We are helping kids get through this, and we are giving them the tools they need in order to not only survive, but to thrive. For many kids, music classes their escape, their happy place, their safe place. 
They are relearning how to take risks and grow. Through music, they are processing their feelings and they are expressing themselves. Music finds its way into the hearts and minds of children. It is vital to kids' mental health and knowing how to use it well is crucial if we are going to see kids come out on the other side. Requiring students to now do the subject creatively and wholeheartedly in a second or third language seems unfair to them. Next slide. Lastly, music is the tie that binds a school together. Music educators seize moments to bring unity and to infuse spirit into an entire school community, boosting its morale. Learning songs in common and singing them together in an assembly, for example, is equity in action as it unites the community and builds relationships. When all students can come together and sing the same songs, the sense of belonging and unity that it creates is unparalleled. These unifying experiences are the ones kids remember and take with them when school is long behind them. The togetherness, the music, the songs, the things that make them laugh or put a smile on their faces are the memories that last. Under the new French immersion delivery model, this sense of community and unity will be lost in our French immersion schools. These schools are already divided by classes, the French and the English. Music has been the one thing all classes have had in common, and it has been a powerful connecting tool. Moving the performing arts and especially music into French even further divides these two streams. As a school board, that promotes equity and inclusion, why wouldn't we consider keeping music in English where all students can unite and feel part of the same community? We understand that French immersion programming needs to change. I wonder how these changes serve our students. Could we consider another way to implement changes that could better serve the needs of our students and be less disruptive to the performing arts instruction, especially music? One Can minute. we revisit subject allocations in French immersion so that music could once again be taught in English? In the light of the points mentioned, would you be willing to reconsider and review the board's decision to change the current delivery model Model of French immersion and to consider other options. Next slide. In closing, I would like to leave you with a quote from one of 20th century's most passionate advocates for music education and, and accessibility, the great composer and conductor, Leonard Bernstein. I propose that the reading and understanding of music be taught to our children from the very beginning of their school life. Children must receive musical instruction as naturally as food and with as much pleasure as they derive from a baseball game. And this must happen from the beginning of their school lives. Thank you for taking the time to consider my concerns and thoughts. I ultimately want to see the best possible outcome for our kids. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Trustees, are there any questions of clarification? Trustee Walton? Yes. Um, so you had a picture up there of um, through you to uh, delegate. So uh, of ukuleles. And so, it, I mean, it was quite colorful, but would it be safe to assume that the equipment that, you know, the music uh, program has purchased Will the um, teacher who's teaching French be able to guide students and teach them in French using all of that equipment? I mean, it just seems like a daunting task if you're not trained musically. It, Ms. Marley, uh, in your opinion? I, I cannot uh, speak for yeah. my colleagues, but Thank you. from listening to my colleagues, there is a great sense of tremendous overload that this is just too much um, because uh, the majority of the people that I work with are not do not have musical training, let alone even music backgrounds. Uh, one colleague in particular comes from France and she is a brilliant French immersion teacher and she um, that is her passion. And now she's looking at uh, and, and, and in, in France, there was no music education in the background. So there's a lot of people who are, are feeling quite overwhelmed. Thank you. Do you have so, a follow-up, Trustee Watson? Yeah, and thank you for your question. <laughs> have a follow-up? So um, I believe that you said to the delegates that we could um, make a motion to refer this as a future agenda item. Request that it be included on a future agenda yeah, item. So I'd like mm -hmm. to make a motion. I mean, there's there's more information, I think, as a board we need to gather. We didn't really make the decision, but there's I, I think there are questions that we really probably should ask. There should be more questions and answers. And um, so I'd like, like to, to make the motion that we refer this as a future agenda item 
to gather more information uh, about this, this change. Is there somebody that would like to second that? Trustee Ramsey? Okay. Are there any comments or questions on that motion? Mm -hmm. Trustee Woodcock? Um, I, I'm having some trouble understanding why we would look at it again when we haven't even implemented the changes that we have come up with from that review. So I, I would be inclined to. I'd like to speak to Tr Trustee Watson, just a minute. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I think that we have, it doesn't hurt to do some so sober second thought and staff have heard the delegates um, information and perhaps um, they can they can take another look make sure that uh, we're on the on the on the path that we're on right now and uh, we can always make changes after we've tried this okay thank you um i'm just going to look to see are there any other comments or questions okay uh, sorry, Trustee Johnson, uh, about the motion or a question of clarification? Because I'll come back after we've dealt with the motion. I guess it's a question about the motion because I'm sitting here and I'm feeling everything you say. People who know me know that I'm, if you don't mind me addressing this. Um, well, if you're addressing the delegation, then I'll come back to you after the motion. Um, yeah, for a question of clarification. Yeah, okay, it's, it's we're just dealing here. with the motion first. Okay, thank you, uh, Trustee Radlin. About the motion. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I heard Trustee Watson say that we hadn't agreed to it, but because it's operational, this was a staff decision. So what? Yeah, trustees uh, uh, didn't make this decision. It was a staff decision. It, because it's operational. So has something changed? Can trustees now make this? I'm, no. not, I'm not sure what what can be done differently now. If it's operational and we are governance. Correct. So what are we able to do in terms of that move? Correct. We, that would not be something that trustees would make a decision on. It would be governance. I believe what Trustee Watson is suggesting is that it come back for uh, so that trustees can ask questions about the decision on a future agenda item. Is that correct, Trustee Watson? And then I'll come back to you to respond to wrap up about the motion. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay, but thank you. So I'll come back to you. I'll come back. Does that answer your question, yes, Trustee Redmond? Yes, okay, thank you. And question about the motion? Yes. Okay. So my question about the motion is a um, little bigger impact. What is the impact of this? Um, Staff schools are already staffing it. I'm not I'm not going to question that this presentation has done a good job of of moving a lot of us and making us think about a lot of things. That certainly is the truth. Um, but we are at a spot here where the decision was made and schools are being staffed. And decisions are moving forward. So if we, we go ahead with this, this has repercussions throughout the entire system. I understand that there has been part of this decision, which was made last June before many of us were trustees was that um, there was going to be review of it because at the, at the end of the first year of it there was going to be a time to stop and review the impact of it um my thought on this is that might be the, a better time to do it because so many things are in motion um and uh and i think this your presentation the presentation earlier might be something we want to keep keep um right at, at a Finger at our fingertips for next year at the time of review too. Um, I guess this is I'm looking at the impact of this. If someone might want to address that, if we were to, to move ahead and ask the ask this, this board to re-examine this, I think the repercussions of this right now could be pretty intense across the whole system. If I'm correct on that, um, would staff like to speak to the if there would be any ramifications of this motion to staffing. Associate Director Schantz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to respond to the trustee question, uh, trustees, we are already into the process of staffing for the 23-24 school year. Uh, in our elementary panel, there are obligations that we have through our collective agreement and established uh, staffing timelines. I can share with trustees that those processes are well into motion at this point. Uh, our staff, uh, due to the requirements that we have have already been notified of their assignments for next year. And uh, as trustees are probably aware, yeah, the staffing process is a very complex process. It takes us well into June. Uh, it started weeks ago and, and will transpire over the course of the next couple months. 
Uh, so, so as the comment has been made, it's very complex, and to to stop that process midstream uh, would be challenging. How to uh, contemplate doing that? Okay, thank you, uh, Trustee Watson. Do thank you want to speak so, to your motion? Yes, thank you. So, um, when we hear the argument um, that uh, you know, when it comes to delegations coming forward, and you know, everything has been accelerated with in terms of staffing and that sort of thing. Why would delegations even come forward? There are many examples where we have asked staff to reconsider, to go back, and sometimes there are changes. When we, we hear it's going to be intense, it's going to be intense because of all the changes, clearly it's going to be intense. It's going to be intense on um, uh, staff already because we're going to have French teachers teaching music who who may not even understand music, and we have equipment that might not even speak. Tonight, this is the first time that I've heard new information. And I think that if for us as a board of trustees, it would be important to gather all the information that we possibly can so that we understand the impact and ramifications on students and staff. And listening to what we had a parent tonight, and we voted down even sending his concerns to get questions. Um, and now we have a staff member who's talking about all of the, the changes that will impact music and and students within the French immersion program. And the and the um, just their sort of their impact with other students within the school. And so now we're saying, well, it's operational. Everyone knows around this table that if we as a board decide to make a motion, if we have agreement with a majority, we can say this isn't operational because we value this and we're deciding right now that this music program needs to be, uh, you know, taught by music teachers, qualified music teachers. And so as far as I'm concerned, everything that I've heard around the table, really, it doesn't disqualify this motion. Boards of trustees are only good as the questions they ask and the information they receive. And right now, I've received new information, and I don't think that it's going to hurt for us to have a report so that we're fully informed instead of looking for reasons why we don't want any information. So I'm so, you know, obviously I put the motion forward. I think that the delegate was compelling, and this is information that we need to make uh, a decision as to whether we want staff to reconsider the music going into English, or sorry, going into French rather than English. Okay, thank you. So the motion has been moved and seconded to uh, request that this item be added to a future agenda item. All in favor? Three, four. Okay, and opposed? Okay, that is not carried. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, moving, uh, Trustee Johnson, did you still have a question of clarification? I did. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Morning. <laughs> Your your message has been actually very well received, more received than it may feel right now. Please know that. You've done a superb job. I'm a retired music teacher. I knew what all that meant. And I, I understand deeply. I'm, I'm sitting here very, very torn right now. Please know that. Um, your question? Can you address choir? Are there options in the school to try and find a way forward with school choirs? Because right now we're addressing classroom situations. Do you see there's possibly some hope or a little bit of a light that you can maybe get some choirs and bring the students together that way? Ms. Morley? Thank you for your question, Trustee Johnson. Um, what you are speaking to is something that is, is, is separate from what was in my delegation. What I was speaking to is primarily a classroom. And 
what you are speaking to is something that would go on outside the classroom sure. in extracurricular. Mm -hmm. And and then you are leaning into, again, teachers doing that extra yeah. mile, which has never, um, th that has never been a, a problem for our lot, uh, many of our very dedicated music teachers who will go the extra mile. But to lean into that as the thing that's going to keep things together when those children have been removed from that teacher's instruction, um, you are eliminating a crucial piece in their feeling like they, they know the teacher or would be comfortable even singing in the choir or would even know that that would be a good fit for them. So removing that instruction from those children in French immersion from grade one all the way along is removing a crucial piece. So to lean into choir as being that piece that's going to fix all of this is uh, very misleading because you'll have a lot of kids who won't even know that that, that would be something they could even do or try. Um, and the relationship piece is also missing. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Thank you. I hear you. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your delegation this evening. Uh, Ms. Pham? A fact to follow. Okay. Whenever you're ready. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for having me back. On January 23rd of this year, I nervously stood before you to advocate for virtual school. In the interest of clarity, I will not be renewing my discussion for the need to continue virtual school or why it needs to be created permanently. And that is because on February the 15th, while I was training for a marathon, I received communication that virtual school would continue. The announcement was a clear demonstration by the school board of your understanding of the parents' rights to choose. On the rest of my run home that day, something that went a lot faster due to the excitement I felt, I envisioned all the possibilities another year in virtual could bring. The success, I thought of the successes we've had in the Regional Spelling Bee and the Science Fair and many others, which still to this day remain forefront in my mind. I thought about the virtual clubs that are available to all of our students that allow them to connect and build for lasting relationships and what more we could add to the coming year. I also thought about all the opportunities that have not been taken, that should be taken, to continue to evolve our virtual school. I thought about the formation of a parent council, something that I am sure was overlooked in the last couple of years, as whether or not virtual school would continue remained in question. I thought about all the ways that platform that the virtual students use could be used to help in-person students and parents share information with teachers when it comes to assignments. I thought of the community events that could be planned by the parent council that would continue to enhance the student experience in virtual school. And I thought of the ways that we could continue to build a proactive, collaborative relationship between parents and this school board, something that is woefully needed in both the virtual and in-person learning environments. I also reflected on this board's policies regarding accessibility and inclusivity that not only mandated the permanent development of virtual school, but how those policies could be used to elevate our school to be the leading virtual school in Canada. That is until April 6, 2023, when I received an email from this school board's communication team. The subject was titled, Updates for Remote Learning for 2023-2024. And in this email was a statement, and I do quote, to ensure clarity and transparency. It then went on to explain a change to French immersion before touching on a survey that was issued. It then went on to say, and once again, I will quote, the survey showed an overall decrease in the interest in remote learning. When I hear of the word transparency, a word that is bandied about far too frequently, I always think of the quote by Frida Lewis Hall, who once said, transparency is the currency of trust. School boards, by nature, are intended to be trusted institutions whose sole focus is to honor and respect that trust given by parents, students, and this community. They are to serve the people and not themselves or their own personal agendas. So in rereading this email, I found the excitement I felt quickly morphed into grave concern. What concerned me the most was the lack of transparency in this email. The statement that there is a decrease in the interest of virtual school, I have since found to be completely inaccurate, as that isn't information that this school board has at this time, even as I stand before you this evening. And I know this because that survey was not sent 
to all the parents of the WRDSB, but was limited to those only in virtual school. The rights of the parents for those in-person children were not included. For clarification, I will say that this survey should never have been sent. An enrollment form should have been sent if accuracy, if understanding accuracy and interest in virtual school was truly the desired outcome. To add to this, I reviewed the messages that I received from angry parents following my previous appearance here. Many of them wanted to know why it was when they approached the principals and staff of their in-person schools, they were told that they were not allowed to switch to virtual. And despite the board's announcement, it would in fact not be available next year. It made me reflect on a call I received from a friend. Her nephew was ready for junior kindergarten. And when her sister tried to enroll him in virtual school, something that is not available on the online enrollment form, when she contacted what would be his homeschool, she also received the response that virtual school would in fact not be happening next year. Again, despite this board's announcement. I then turned my attention to our school's social media platform and found that the continuation and successes of virtual school have not been given fair representation, if they are mentioned at all. As my frustration mounted, I came across a news article I'd seen before this school board announced the virtual would continue. It was an announcement of several other school boards in Ontario that had proactively decided to not only continue virtual school, but are looking into continuing it permanently. So in the interest of transparency this evening, I thought I would share with you, I decided to make a few phone calls. I called the Toronto District School Board and I asked them, if I moved to their region, would I be able to enroll my elementary school child in their virtual pro program next year? I was not only told yes straight off the bat, I was then given a very excited speech about the program and what it had to offer. I then called the Durham District School Board, Ottawa Kent, and several others who confirmed that virtual school would be a part of their school board. The response I got was the same as with the TDSB. But not only that, several of them told me and confirmed that they were in fact looking into making this a permanent part of their school system. When I also turned my attention to their online platforms, I was even able to find information about their virtual schools, their virtual school successes, and what they intend for the year to come. So when I say that this board is misinformed about the level of interest in virtual school, I can look to these things. The lack of inclusion of in-person parents in that survey, the lack of knowledge of in-person staff, the absence of options on kindergarten enrollment forms, and the lack of presence in social media. It all leads me to wonder, how can any organization accurately and honestly be transparent when they have not sought the input of all of those of whom they serve? And how can any parent make an informed decision about their child, a decision that is not only theirs by nature, but by legal right, when that information is withheld from them? I have watched the delegations that have come before me and after me. And the common thread I have noticed is parents' need for transparency and the belief that this school board is not providing it. What I will say is this, it is my belief that this was not, in this case, intentionally done. I firmly believe that the school board did not intend to be so contradictory in action and in word, and that simple human, human misunderstandings are the true culprits here. Something I know, now that you are aware, as I am sure you were unaware of before, will be corrected. As a girl, I played the game telephone, and I remember how easily a message could be confused as it filtered through each person in the line. I can only assume that these contradictions are a result of too many voices and the message, the true intent being lost. And as I am sure that the school board has nothing but the best of intentions when it comes to our children, I am sure that you will take action. However, there is one thing I would like to remind you. You are not the ones raising these children during these unprecedented times. These are times where a pandemic has changed our social and societal structures. YouTube is considered an accredited authority on everything, and a child's self-esteem is determined by likes and follows. Your job is to help these children by teaching academics to help ensure they have the knowledge to combat these things and can learn to think for themselves in an environment, in any environment, that will provide a safe, inclusive feeling to allow them to grow. Which is why I know that this mistake will be corrected, because it is just that. It's a mistake. There is not a sinister conspiracy or a malicious plot. It's just a simple mistake. It's the whole reason why there are erasers on pencils, because everybody deserves a second chance. Not only do I know that this is a mistake, I know that within the next few days, that survey will be rescinded and that a properly worded enrollment form 
for virtual school will be issued to all parents, not just virtual, but for in-person students as well, with a proper period for consideration. I know that kindergarten enrollment will be updated to allow those parents to choose virtual for their young children. And I know that those who have already registered will be contacted and advised of the right to choose. I know that our social media will begin to reflect the incredible work, some of which you may not know is happening right now, of not only our virtual staff, but of our students. And I know that all staff members of the WRDSB will be dutifully informed about virtual school and all that it does have to offer. And I know that you will begin to work on a permanent creation of virtual school, like the other school boards this evening I've mentioned have. And I ask that you consider the other things that I spoke about earlier, the creation of a parent council, the community events, and all the other things that the school deserves in the name of equality. And I know that these things will be done because you understand the value of having a parent's trust. And you understand that true transparency is not only how you earn, but you keep that trust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pham? Uh, Trustee Woodcock? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to make sure it's a question of clarification, yes, Madam Chair. Ahead. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Mm -hmm. You're calling for the creation of a remote or virtual school council parent council as it's, well as those issues that I brought up being addressed. It's called a school council. Oh, a school council. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The it's been a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. That's in the edit. Um, okay. So you want, uh, that's what you're calling for. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there questions of clarification? Trustee Watson. Um, I don't have a question of clarification, but I'd like to forward the delegation questions and suggestions to staff so that they can respond to the delegate. So they can respond to the delegate. Okay, thank you. Are you seconding that motion, Trustee Ramsey? Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Trustee Woodcock? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm i confused, a, a little confused, Madam Chair, about ooh, that we are, a new survey is going out. I, I don't understand. Is, is that through you, Madam Chair? Um, not I that, I, staff not that I'm aware of, but I can ask staff. Uh, I can clarify that, actually. Um, okay. So the Go survey ahead. was sent okay. uh, earlier this year, and my understanding is that there will not be another survey, and at some point an enrollment form will be issued, but it has only been limited to virtual school parents. Okay. Uh, Associate Director Miller or Ms. Duke and McKenzie? Or, okay, no. wrong one. Mr. Schatz. <laughs> I'm in the middle, so I'll answer this. Uh, it's my, it's, uh, I'd like to provide some information to trustees from my understanding. That About the survey? Heard, yeah, there has been a survey okay. that was, was sent uh, to families in the remote learning to gauge the interest of the program. Uh, I would suggest, Madam Chair, that in the past, if there were families that were in brick and mortar buildings, wishing to transition into a remote learning. We have accommodated classes, situations like that, but that has been a very, a very small number. And in fact, a majority of the cases over the last year or two, we've seen families uh, choosing to, to transition in the opposite direction into brick and mortar schools. Okay, thank you. Um, trustees, are there any questions about the motion? Seeing none. We have a motion to refer this to staff uh, for follow-up to the delegates' questions. All in favor? Okay. And opposed? Okay. And that motion is carried. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions of clarification? No. Okay. Um, just looking at the time, it is 8.04, and we will take a 15-minute break and reconvene at 8.20 exactly. Okay.
They're recording the meeting. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, we are continuing with our delegations. Um, um, wait for our virtual delegates to come in. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Glasson, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, great. I'm going to read the delegation procedures again. Um, in accordance with the board's bylaws, delegations have up to 10 minutes to address the board. Any exceptions to this rule require a majority vote. All remarks are to be confined to the issue you are addressing and discourteous language, reference to personalities, or statements contravening the Ontario Human Rights Code or the Charter of Rights and Freedoms will not be tolerated. At the beginning of your presentation, the timer will be set for 10 minutes. When nine minutes have passed, I will advise you that you have one minute remaining to bring your comments to a close. Following your presentation, trustees will have an opportunity to ask only questions of clarification relating to your remarks. If the item you are addressing is listed on the agenda, then trustees will discuss the matter at the appropriate time. If your issue is not listed on the agenda, then trustees may opt to present a motion to refer it to staff for follow-up or request that it be included on a future meeting agenda or add the item to the meeting agenda, which would require a two-thirds vote of trustees present in, to vote in favor of adding it to the agenda. Okay, um, Ms. Glasson, no presentation, so whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Oh. I can't hear you. Now you can hear me better. Okay, perfect. There you go. Hello, my name is Kate Glasson, and I'm a local grandmother and mother with five kids, <clears throat> excuse me, currently in the uh, WRDSB, three previously. Um, so I've got a fair bit of experience with this organization. I, um, I hear a lot of talk about parents' rights at these uh, meetings, and what I don't hear an awful lot of talk about is children's rights. And that's where I'd like to start my, my delegation tonight um, with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which Canada is a signatory, we have Article 17, which is that the child has the right to access to info that is non-harmful, among other things. But... That's the, the gist of it, access to info that's non-harmful. Uh, in 28, Article 28, they have the right to access to education. Please note, the child has the right to access to education. Not the parent, but the child has the right. And the aims of the education is that the child should fully develop themselves. It should teach them to understand their own rights and to respect other people's rights, cultures, and differences. 
All right, this is important stuff. So we are a ratified member of this treaty. Okay, a signatory to this treaty. It's important to keep that in mind. Now, I recently saw a little meme with an amazing amount of great information in it. It pointed out that if a black child is old enough to experience racism, then their white classmates are old enough to read about it. Because the one child doesn't get to not experience it. So why should the other kids be shielded from it as well? All right. If they're shielded from it, they never learn not to do it. So it's really important that they learn this stuff. The same applies to queer identities. All right. Um, if a, if a child is old enough to claim an identity and to be harmed by others because of it, then we owe it to those children to give them education about how to stop taking away other people's rights. That's in their rights as well, okay? And um, the other piece that I wanted to get to here is that queer-related material is not inherently bad for children as long as it's age appropriately done, all right? So no, obviously, six-year-olds shouldn't be reading about sex acts. And I'd be terribly surprised if they actually are. But fair enough, some people say that's happening. Okay, I'm, okay. But, you know, if I have my 12-year-old and my 13-year-old going to school, I don't have a problem with somebody in middle school accessing something with simple descriptions of sex acts because they're old enough to be curious about it at that age. They're old enough to be getting involved in it at that age. It's as good a time as any that they be taught about it. And I don't believe that a parent needs the right to be able to opt out of it because it's the child's right to that education. It is our right as a society to see these children be educated, all right? We get to see them as full citizens. That's what we're training them. That's what we're educating them to be, full citizens, okay? Lastly, um, in terms of, of um, oh no, there was one more. Children are generally aware of their gender and sexuality by the time they're beginning school. It is, I think, inherently absurd to suggest that children can be some of these identities, but not be allowed to read about themselves or their classmates' lives. That, that just doesn't make any sense to me. We do them no favors by limiting their exposure only to the things they've already been exposed to. Sooner or later in life, they will have to encounter people different from them, and those people deserve to have fellow citizens who've been educated to respect the rights of others. Part of that education is necessarily access to reading material that covers those others' lives. Parents who are afraid of people who are different may choose to wear blinders. That is their choice. What is not their choice is to force their children to wear the same blinders. Thank you. That's all I've got to say for tonight. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Glasson. Trustees, are there any questions of clarification? Trustee Johnson? Thank you for the chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Can you just clarify for me? I was trying to take some notes. So which treaty is that Article 17 from about that you had mentioned at the beginning of your talk? Can you just repeat that again? Ms. Glasson? Yeah. Yes, please, uh, Chair. It's the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Thank you. Got that, Mr. Uh, Trustee Johnson? Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions of clarification? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you, Ms. Glasson, for your uh, delegation this evening. You'll be removed from the Zoom meeting, but you're welcome to watch the rest of the meeting on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Byrd? And I believe you have a presentation, so we'll just pause for a moment while Ms. Rydell gets it set up.
Okay, whenever you're ready. Perfect. All right, so uh, I hope also you were, should have been emailed a longer document that this is based off of. It's 16 pages, so bear with me while I try to summarize this in 10 <laughs> minutes. But I'm happy to give more answers and questions of clarification, or I do believe the board is allowed to extend time if they see fit. Um, on top of that, just a warning that I will be discussing transphobia and other uh, homophobia and other hate speech. I will not be repeating it, but this topic will come up. So if anyone needs to pause or remove themselves or whatever, like do that, take care of yourself first. Um, and then also I have omitted names where requested as by the delegation rules, but publicly in other places, I do have this presentation available with those names removed if that's of interest. Thank you. So I'll start now on the next slide. So we've seen an increasing amount of anti-2S LGBTQ plus hate targeting schools. This recent election saw coordinated effort by far-right organizations to elect trustees that align with these goals. I created this resource to provide a summary of the issues and the current landscape of the work being done to promote 2S LGBTQ plus inclusion. Uh, it's partly inspired by Canadian Anti-Hate Network's resource that is addressing racial hate in schools. Next slide. So we have an issue of this study is showing that 62% of 2S LGBTQ plus respondents felt unsafe at school compared to 11% of cisgender heterosexual students. So we see there's an issue of hate within school that is so blatantly obvious. And we have this effort by people trying to put up these human rights for debate. And as Kate has mentioned, and I'll mention later, that we have a very firm international and local rules about rights that need to be upheld. In the U.S., we've seen restrictions on healthcare, education, free speech, and civil rights for 2S LGBTQ plus individuals. And our school boards have been largely unprepared and unequipped for this. I appreciate the effort that a lot of these trustees have been making, but you are not equipped to deal with this, and I don't expect you to be equipped to understand the ins and outs of extremism and hate groups. And so I'm hoping this resource begins to help you understand it and how we can address this, because it is existing and it's coming for our schools. Next slide. So I just want to go over a little bit of the foundation of these rights. So the Charter and Human Rights outline these rights as protected. Supreme Court has actually even ruled that schools can be held legally responsible for discriminatory actions by students by not creating an environment that stops that. So not only does this board have a moral obligation to protect these students, it does have a legal obligation to protect 2S LGBTQ plus students from hate, from themselves, from the board, and from other students. You have that legal responsibility, even if it is external actions from people by creating the environment you have. The Ontario Human Rights Commission has specific policies and practices outlined to ensure that you fulfill your human rights code duties. And many WRSB procedures align with this, specifically procedure 1235. That's about protecting a child's right to privacy, to protect their pronouns or their gender identity from their parents if they do not want that shared with their parents or guardians. And then also, as Kate wonderfully mentioned, there's the UN Commission of the Rights of the Child. We have the rights for free expression, for education, privacy, and access to information. In my document, I go more into depth of how those specifically apply. Next page. I want to go through a few arguments that we see often used by people trying to attack 2S LGBTQ plus individuals. So the first one is age appropriateness of books. We've seen boards targeted with false allegations of pornography, specifically in BC, RCMP even investigated and found that there was no, it became obviously clear immediately by the RCMP that these allegations were false. As WRSB has stated themselves that these are almost exclusively targeting books with 2S LGBTQ representation. And this has been a, a concerted effort to reframe the issue in order to gain more support. It's a lot harder to get people to try and hate individuals than to make them scared that their children are being exposed to child pornography. It's an outright lie and it's, beca it's being per perpetuated here and in so many other places. It also argues that queer people's existence isn't appropriate for younger children to understand or read about or see. It's a restriction on the child's rights to access information for their well-being and health as outlined by international law. And it's also an effort to eliminate the existence of 2S LGBTQ plus individuals from our books and from our education materials. Next slide. The other argument we see a lot is parental rights. Um, historically, this has been raised in opposition to the expansion of children's rights, um, both 
in labor rights and children's rights in the states and the UK is where the origin of this term even comes from. It's often rooted in religious sentiments, specifically Christian, that views parental authority as um, above almost anything else. And it's an effort to enforce their personal beliefs, not only on their own children, but on other children. So if these so-called parental rights existed, they would still be violating other parental rights by trying to enact it in the school and forcing a school to adhere to their beliefs. The Supreme Court has ruled in Canada that there's no basis for parental wishes to have priority. Ultimately, the best interest of the child are paramount. And so we have legal rulings also to outline that our goal is to take care of the children and in promote their rights. And our concern should not be for parental rights because we do not have a proper outline of what those even are or how far they extend. But we do know what the children's rights are and we need to uphold those. This argument specifically tar targets teaching subjects and it's trying to eliminate now not only from our resources, but from discussions that from about 2S LGBTQ plus people from schools. Next one. We also see accusations of child abuse or grooming directed at educational officials and also in other people working. Again, historically, this has been used against minority groups, specifically black people. And also in like the gay panic, we saw these things being used and it's just repeating itself. Um, it's based on harmful stereotypes about 2S LGBTQ plus people. It justifies discrimination, harassment, and violence against these people. And in fact, 2S LGBTQ plus individuals are at a higher risk of experiencing sexual violence. And so these accusations not only aren't caring for the children that are actually at risk, they're further pushing them into harm by veiling the issue under something that doesn't exist. As we said, it's also been used against drag performers. We've seen that very often across countries. And again, this lowers the barrier of violence by justifying actions because it is a lot easier to get someone to do something violent if they think children's safety are at risk than if they're just thinking it's some political agenda. Next one. Then we have ideological indoctrination, kind of arguing that schools are trying to indoctrinate children. It tries to shift the argument from, the, from people to ideas and it justifies debating these human rights when we're talking about people. You'll see gender ideology used often. This was actually created by the Catholic Church to oppose a UN effort to recognize gender and sexuality rights. And as an example, we've seen in March, a Daily Wire host said that transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. And that transgender people are not a legitimate category of being. Well, they are using the words transgenderism, they mean trans people. They are trying to eradicate them from public life entirely. It's disguising their effort to eradicate these people, and it is a major threat. Next one. So where do these lead? I've mentioned the idea of eliminating or eradicating. A better way to say this would be called genocide. That's simply what it is when you're trying to eliminate a class of people or a group of people. The Lumpkin Institute for Genocide, named after the man who coined the word genocide, has specifically called arguments targeting transgender people as genocidal logic. And it's really important to understand the logical conclusion of these arguments that we're hearing in our board, in our schools and across our country. Because part of this effort is to minimize their arguments to make them seem like they're not a big deal. They are a big deal. Next slide. In fact, we even have a sitting trustee right now that has tweeted this saying that trans kids aren't a thing. This is contributing to this genocidal logic that has been being argued and is absolutely a threat to the safety of students and staff. Next slide. We also have connections to other hateful, hateful ideologies. So we have this historical connection with all these arguments, but also a very present connection to other hate groups. It's not unique. A lot of hate movements all kind of combine and group together on various issues. It's important to understand these intersections, however, to know how these organizations serve to, as recruitment for other more violent groups. As an example, we've seen multiple cases of neo-Nazis joining anti-drag and anti-2S LGBTQ plus protests. This is a severe safety risk as these groups have been known in the past to conduct terrorist and violent attacks, and it is a very harmful and concerning escalation. Next slide. One of these ideologies is Christian nationalism. We might hear about it a lot in the States, but it exists in Canada as well. It's the idea that you're, people are trying to impose Christian values or morals upon a population. Uh, Christian being a very specific form of Christian ideals. It's based on conservative beliefs about marriage and gender. There's a long history of these Christian nationalist groups trying to oppose abortion, sex ed, 2SLGBTQ plus rights. 
It's also often Islamophobic, anti-immigration and anti-indigenous as the colonial project of Canada and residential schools was clearly immersed in Christian nationalism of trying to educate indigenous people to be Christians. And also there's a very, very strong overlap of white supremacy. Next slide. One example is Voices for Change, an organization that existed in this community. They had people delegating here and organizing people to witness meetings and come to the meetings. The website promoted residential school denial articles, genocide denial, and it was run by a board member of a very large church in Kitchener. One minute. Thanks. Um, and so they have changed to an explicitly Christian media account now, but they are in a church, they are in a leader position in, in a church, and this is a tweet that I have blocked out because they specifically call for violence against trans people. Next slide. Uh, and then we have white supremacy. Uh, while the white is the primary part, patriarchy and Western values play a key role in this. And so the existence of 2S LGBTQ plus people directly challenges their beliefs. Anti-Semitism is also prevalent well, along with the conspiracy theories. In the US, we've also seen anti-woke efforts combined with this. Uh, in Peterborough, there was a protest with had a sign calling for the destruction of drag performers from a neo-Nazi again, and hate and violence are at the core of this ideology. And lastly, I can get through it, uh, about how to take action. There's lots of things you can do. I have more in the document for a lot of people, but use the code of conduct to make sure trustees are not spreading hate as they have been previously. Uh, update delegation rules to ensure that we're not exposing people to hateful ideas. Don't implement policy that would require delegations on both sides of an issue. This raises the ability for people to argue human rights. Uh, ban delegations from known groups that seek to violate the rights of 2 LGBT, LGBTQ plus people. This has been done in BC already. Interrupt delegations when they're spreading hate and stop it as fast as possible and use legal recourse when possible to continue advancing these protections. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for your delegation. Uh, Mr. Burr, trustees, are there questions of clarification? Trustee Johnson? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. You brought a really crucial concern that's growing in the community to our attention. Even a superb job. I, if I can ask, can we have a copy of the presentation? Yeah. I, I believe that's already been sent. Yes, done. Yeah. Okay. The, the, Thank you. The, oh, sorry. Yeah, Ms. Rydell has already forwarded the, the yeah. delegation. There's a copy of the full document, and then also publicly online, there's a web version to access it along with the slideshow presentation. Okay. So everything will all be together. Beautiful. Thank you for Thank that. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there other questions of clarification? I am not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Burr, for your uh, delegation this evening. Let's pause for one moment. Uh, Mr. Sloss, you can start coming up. We'll just pause to, before you get started. Ready? Okay. And you have a so I'll just wait for Ms. Rydell to get that going. Okay. okay, whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Craig Sloss. I'm a data scientist living in Waterloo, and I wanted to talk to you today about some concerns I have about recent attempts to limit freedom of expression at the board. Uh, next slide, please. In the first section, I'll discuss how misuse of the delegation process is limiting residents' ability to provide effective feedback to the board. I'll make some concrete suggestions for improving the delegation process, such as giving priority to first-time delegates, publishing meeting content well in advance, and continuing to make transparent public responses, such as the recent open letter. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to delegate at the March 20th meeting, but when I went to the website to sign up, I found a message stating that all the delegation spots were full. When the, the agenda was released, I was disappointed to see that two of the slots were taken up by individuals who previously and quite recently delegated to the board. After seeing that the delegation list was full, I was a bit shocked on the night of the meeting when the board voted to add a third repeat delegate to the agenda. Allowing individuals to make repeated use of limited delegation slots presents a barrier to community members expressing their views to the board. I think a careful balance is needed here. I don't think it's a good idea to prohibit return delegations out, outright. Uh, these may make sense if material new information is being presented or if the topic is completely different. But we have to ensure that repeated delegations aren't shutting out other voices. 
Uh, one way to balance this would be to give priority to first time delegates to ensure that the board is hearing from a variety of voices in the community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, being shut out of the delegation list was especially jarring, given that one of the delegations claimed to speak on behalf of constituents. I'm personally one of the constituents of Waterloo Wilmot, so it was especially frustrating to not only to be prevented from expressing my own views in the meeting, but to see our community's views uh, misrepresented. We just had an election to decide who speaks for our constituency, and the ones who do are all sitting on that side of the podium. Former candidates have the same right as everyone else to express their own views, but they don't have the right to claim to speak for the constituency or to speak at every meeting like some kind of unelected non-voting trustee. When delegation spots are scarce, limiting the number of repeat delegations would make it easier for residents to express their views. Uh, next slide, please. Another challenge faced by potential delegates is that the agenda for each meeting is posted only a few days prior to the meeting. Not knowing what will be discussed in the meeting makes it difficult uh, for us to decide whether or not we want to sign up to delegate. It's important for us to be able to confirm our delegation well in advance so that we have time to prepare. I recently gave delegations to the City of Waterloo and Regional Council as part of their budget feedback meetings. And I have some suggestions based on my own experience preparing for those delegations. Uh, something that helped me delegate in those situations was that the documents being discussed at the meeting were posted online well enough in advance that I could read them thoroughly and prepare my presentation based on them. The board could do something similar by posting the text of motions that will be discussed well in advance of the meeting. I also invested a significant amount of effort vetting the content in my presentations, and I cut out anything that I wasn't fully confident I could stand behind. I was, after all, speaking to a government, uh, an official government body, and I felt the responsibility to ensure that I was only providing accurate and relevant information. Producing a well-validated presentation is a very time-consuming process, but it takes no effort to simply regurgitate social media conspiracy theories of accusing the board of facilitating child abuse or to complain about a book you haven't read. Allowing more lead time to prepare presentations won't prevent delegations from uh, being used to spread misinformation, but it will at least create a level playing field for those who take factual accuracy seriously. Given that the, the, the delegation process has been used to, uh, oh, sorry, next slide. Given that the delegation process has been used to spread disinformation, I'm fully supportive of the board's open letter uh, because it corrected on, on the record uh, statements that were uh, either outright false or which omitted uh, material information. Having access to factual information is a necessary ingredient for the public to give meaningful feedback. I am, however, concerned that the board is now being pressured to not make statements like the open letter. As a member of the public, I expect that if matters of public interest are raised in a public forum, then the public should uh, participate in the response, should be included in the response. There have been suggestions at recent board meetings that responses should be provided only in private to the delegates. This kind of secrecy would not be consistent with the degree of transparency that the board should aspire to, and it shuts other members of the public out of the discussion. Especially with, when disinformation is involved, the failure to respond publicly would simply allow the disinformation to fester. I would encourage the board to continue to respond in a manner such as the open letter when faced with disinformation in the future. And on the next slide, um, I think the open letter also did an excellent job of setting the standard for the type of feedback that's valuable in delegations. Uh, they say that hate, racism, and xenophobia are not opinions that should be gathered through consultations. When scarce delegation spots are used for such things, residents are prevented from providing valid feedbacks on topics that are actionable by the board. Uh, and on the next slide, now, having discussed concerns about the delegation process, I'd like to move on to some concerns I have about the content of the delegations and how they present a risk to freedom of expression. Even if the board takes no action in response to certain delegations, the delegations can, do, can still do harm by creating a chilling effect among students and staff. A recent delegate advocated that the school board should be outing transgender students without their consent, a clear breach of the student's privacy that would interfere with students' ability to express themselves at school. The board does have an administrative procedure protecting transgender uh, students' privacy. It's nevertheless critical that a privacy guarantee be viewed by everyone as a long-term commitment. Even if a privacy guarantee is in place today, transgender students may be reluctant to confide in the teacher if they are worried that their confidence may be violated at some point in the future due to political pressure placed on the board. 
Advocating that the board out transgender students can still harm students, even if that advocacy isn't successful in changing the board's procedure. I would encourage the board to look for ways to make it clear to everyone that the idea of outing transgender students is completely off the table, even if that just means the board is reaffirming a current practice. One option would be to consider uh, enshrining privacy protections for transgender students in the board policy, in addition to the administrative procedure, to emphasize our continued commitment to protect, protecting the rights of transgender students. Delegations that uh, pressure the board to limit access to books based on personal, political, or moral opinions can also create a chilling effect by discouraging libraries from carrying certain books in order to avoid uh, controversy. It's important that the individuals charged with selecting resources for schools maintain their professional standards in the face of such pressure. Looking at what's happening in other jurisdictions allows us to see where things can lead once we start down the path of challenging books and hopefully stop us from getting there. Uh, the photo on this slide is from a school in Florida of bookshelves with, uh, that were emptied out while the books were being reviewed to determine whether or not they met with the approval of the state. Uh, on the next slide, uh, once a president is set that banning books is an acceptable practice, the tactic is frequently removed, used to remove cultural representations of LGBTQ plus communities or people of color. On the next slide, it's even gotten so bad that now even math textbooks are too woke for Florida. This shows how ridiculous things can get once you start going down the path of banning books. As a practicing mathematician, I took this one a bit personally. Uh, having a broad understanding of systemic bias is an essential skill for anyone working in data science, because we need to be able to understand how these biases get reflected uh, in the data that we're working with. And on the next slide, uh, author Maggie Takuda Hall recently reported that Scholastic's educational division would not license her book, Love in the Library, unless she deleted all references to racism in her author's note. The political pressure to ban books in the United States is already starting to erode the professional standards that govern the publishing industry. These are cautionary tales of where things lead once you start down the path of censoring books based on the political or moral opinions of delegates. And on the next slide, to stop us from heading in this direction, the board should explore actions that reinforce its commitment not to censor books. One option could be to improve the reconsideration procedures that are part of the guidelines on the selection of educational resources. The reconsideration procedures apply in situations where a parent or guardian seeks to restrict access to resources for students other than their own children. The process begins with an informal evaluation of the resource against the selection criteria. Point and if minute. the requester is not satisfied with this outcome, they have two opportunities for, for appeal first to a site level committee, and then to a larger formal committee uh, with a broader membership. What I noticed about this approach is that it's one-sided. We can only request reconsideration of a decision to include a resource, but not a decision to uh, remove one. Broadening the reconsideration procedure to allow for appeals in situations where a resource has been inappropriately removed would provide a safeguard against chilling effects resulting from the political pressure being placed on the board. I will also note that the reconsideration process did not involve delegations to the board. With limited delegation slots available at each meeting, having residents express their feedback on individual books through the correct forum would free up scarce delegation spots for residents to express their concerns to the board. I would encourage the board to consider my suggestions when discussing changes to the delegation process, as well as considering how to respond to recent delegations. Thank you for your time, uh, for taking the time to listen to my feedback. Thank you, Mr. Sloss. Uh, trustees, are there any questions of clarification? Trustee Woodcock? Uh, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wonder if we could, um, if trustees could receive a copy of the slide deck from okay. um, the delegation. Mr. Sloss? Uh, sure, and I can send the actual text as well. Um, the way I design slides, I don't really design them to be read. I usually intend them to be you know, Great. assisting a, a presentation. Okay, we'll thank you. Time. If you could send those with the notes, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, Trustee Wasim? Uh, my question was going to be the same as Trustee Woodcox. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Trustee Radlin? Thank you, Sue Yu Chair. Thank you very much for that thoughtful and informative presentation. And um, you gave a lot of uh, facts and 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 i may, i may have missed this um 
how much of what you presented um, in terms of, you know, the attitude to books and, and all of those kinds of stuff, how much of what you presented is taken from Canadian scenarios? Mr. Sass? Uh, I think those were all uh, American scenarios. Yeah. What we're seeing generally, I think, is that that seems to be the canary on the coal mine, and it's starting to migrate up here. What we're seeing is that uh, the kind of activities that uh, the kind of advocacy that's happening at our board now is similar to what was seen in U.S. boards of education um, years ago. Follow up, Trustee Radlin. Hello, thank you. That was my thinking. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Johnson. Thank you to the chair. I appreciate your comments. Uh, very, by the way, very well thought through presentation. Thank you. And I uh, was curious about your comment about how much you appreciated the open letter. Um, I was trying to follow up your thought on that. Are you su suggesting that the idea of having an open letter response is a good idea in terms of every presentation that is brought to us here at the table? Uh, not I literally every presentation. Yeah, not literally everything, but um, obviously using judgment, right? But I was careful to word it to say um, involve the public in some way, right? So if it's a kind of thing where most of the, the the discussion is really with the delegate, it's still nice maybe for the public to hear, yes, we resolved this and this is the resolution, right? But if it's maybe a broader disinformation that needs to be dispelled, maybe a broader response is needed. Okay. Follow up, Trustee Johnson? No, thank you very much. Okay. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Sauce, for your de de uh, delegation. <clears throat> okay, we are moving on uh, policy and governance, uh, board policy G2001. I don't know why I had trouble saying that. Um, trustee code of conduct. So um, this one is for me. So as you may know, the Ministry of Education is reviewing the code of conduct process for boards across the province. The ministry is currently proposing some changes to the process but we are required to review and approve our code of conduct annual, annually by May 15th of the year. On the advice of OPSPA, uh, the policy working group is recommending that we pass our code of conduct without any changes at this time. So uh, there is a recommendation on Leo 1 uh, that the Waterloo Region District School Board approve board policy G201 trustee code of conduct as presented at the April 19th committee of the whole meeting. Um, and that starts on folio three. Would someone like to move that motion? Moved by Trustee Meisner, seconded by Trustee Johnson. Are there any questions or comments on this? Trustee Ramsey? Thank you. Uh, I guess my question is uh, with respect to um, uh, Bill 98 and uh, you know, uh, contained in Bill 98 is uh, a provision that uh, existing word um, codes of conduct uh, will continue in place until they, um, if and when the uh, new legislation re receives royal assent. So I'm not sure um, why it is that we need to go ahead and to be um, ratifying this, considering the fact that the government has already said that uh, the old codes of conduct uh, stays in place. So not sure what the legal ramifications are, and I'm not trying to provide advice to the board, but I'd just like some clarification as to um, um, how new is that information from OPS, I guess, um, saying to adopt or uh, to keep that we need to vote uh, to do this, and then down the road we have to vote to rescind then, uh, assuming the government um, and as well as sent for the uh, new legislation that uh, takes the power away from board to uh, weaponize um, codes of conduct. So uh, in the status um, right now, there is a requirement that trustees approve the code of conduct by May 15th of every year. So every, uh, four, year. every four years, sorry. And we are due uh, for that. Um, so ours is up for renewal uh, as of May 15th, 2023. So our options were to make some changes now or to present it as is. And OPSPA's, um, you asked when that was uh, dated for OPSPA's advice. Uh, October 28th, 2021 was the letter. I'll turn to Trustee Woodcock to see if she knows offhand. 
I don't, uh, through you, Madam Chair, I don't know the actual date, but it was in one of the media or one of the legislative updates that all trustees receive from OPSPA. Um, the, there was a, a paragraph about that this regulation is still on the books, so we have to complete this. It's a timing thing. And and then depending on what happens with the uh, with the new code of conducts that are going to come in, so it's a timing thing. And I honestly I can't remember. All trustees did get do get the legislative updates, and I want to say it was in um, maybe February or March. Yeah, I'm I'm not finding it very. Perhaps much. Trustee Piatkowski can remember. If he's still on, he's still on, but his camera isn't working this evening. So, Trustee Piotowski, can you? I can't find. Are you there? Yeah. I would have to uh, to do a search of my uh, emails, but I I do think that it was in uh, in February because I remember it being referred to at the March uh, policy uh, uh, working group meeting. Oh. Um, and and if I'm if I may. Um, the proposed legislation is uh, is not in effect, so we we can't follow legislation that has not been passed by the legislature. We have to pass the legislation that has all. We have to follow the legislation that already exists, and that requires us to make this decision tonight. Thank you, uh, Trustee Piatowski, for that information, and Trustee Woodcock for that uh, tr follow up. Trustee Ramsey. Yes, Madam Chair. As I mentioned, the. Um, I asked the question because simply I felt that uh, the information from OPSBA predates the uh, tabling of uh, Bill 98. And um, according to Bill 98, uh, and it contradicts obviously what my colleagues are saying, is that uh, codes of conduct that are um, in place will continue until the legislation receives royal assent. So uh, I'm just saying that I think we're wasting our time adopting this and having to go through, and I'm not providing advice. I just thought that maybe there was some uh, there would would have been some follow up with um, ops, but to be more current with respect to this recommendation that we are uh, considering. But it's up to the board what he wants to do. I will not be um, supporting the recommendation because I think it's um, redundant, and the ministry has seen through that. Um, obviously, um, boards don't have the capability to um, be um, administering codes of uh, conduct. So I will not be, I'll, I'll be voting against this. I'll wait for the ministry one. Okay. Um, I think as Trustee Piotowski noted that it is not uh, royal assent yet, but there is a regulation on the books that we do have to pass it by May 15th every four years, which ours is come due. So by not passing a code of conduct on May 15th, I believe would would be in violation, contradiction, whatever word you want to use. Um, yeah, trustee, uh, trustee Woodcock, is that your understanding throughout? Yeah, we have to submit the reconfirmation through you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. The, we have to submit the reconfirmation by May 15th, correct? Okay. 2020. Trustee Watson, thank you. Through you to whoever. Um, so what is the purpose of having to adopt the code of conduct every four years? What is the purpose? What, what purpose does OPSPA have for asking school boards? Because we have policies that we adopt or that we review and we go through them and then, you know, we, we pass, uh, you know, we vote on, you know, supporting those. Um, and we do that every year. If so I can just. We, yeah, I just want to understand why this is, this needs, is, is there a something legal attached to there is ontario regulation 246 uh slash 18 section 21 every board that adopted a code of conduct before the day this regulation came into a force shall review its code of conduct in accordance with subsection 3 on or before may 15th 2019 and on or before may 15th of every fourth year thereafter and so we are due as of may 15th 2023 to review our code of conduct. And because our understanding and OPSPA's understanding is that the ministry is reviewing the code of conduct process, the policy working group has made a recommendation that we keep the status quo for now because 
changes are probably coming soon from the ministry. And once we receive those changes, once they've been put into law, then we can review our code of conduct to make sure that we are in compliance with the new legislation. Does that uh, so, clarify? So when it, it states to review it, um, that means a formal adoption at the board table? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and it will go through the policy working group just like all of our policies will. Yeah, I guess I'm just struggling with Bill 98 and what would happen if we don't? Well, right now we're under Ontario Regulation 24618, so we would not be in compliance with that. Bill 98, as far as I know, unless something happened in the last few hours, has not been passed yet. So that is not what's governing governing us. Right now we're being governed by 24618. So I, I understand that. And um, and once it passes, then I... I understand assume. that as well. Okay. I, I do understand how the provincial government okay. works. But I... As Trustee Ramsey was talking about, since this is going through through the process, it just seems redundant to me. It and does. It feels like I'm checking yeah. a box here, and that's what we're doing to make sure that we're in compliance until the new legislation is passed and we receive guidance from the ministry, and at which time we will revisit this probably in, I, I'm not going to guess how long, if that makes sense. Okay. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, there is uh, a record. I did, uh, oh, I did find the sorry, date. Sorry, Trustee Piotowski, I'm having trouble without your camera on seeing your hand uh, raised. Go ahead, uh, Trustee Piotowski. Uh, yes, I found it. It, it was uh, the legislative update from Friday, March the 10th. So yes, it did predate the legislation, but the, the current regulation does remain in effect and we are obliged to follow it. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions. All in favor of the recommend, and, and I will be voting on this, all in favor of the recommendation on Folio 1 to pass the Code of Conduct as presented. And opposed? Okay, and that motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to reports, renaming of A.R. Kaufman Public School, uh, Superintendent Giannopoulos and Hill. Through the chair to trustees, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and share the work uh, that we've been undertaking over the past many months. Uh, Superintendent Krista Hill and I are um, going to work our way through both reports that you will find on Folio 16, uh, which is a recommendation to approve a new name for A.R. Kaufman Public School, in addition to the report on Folio 21, which is a recommendation for renaming of uh, Ryerson Public School. I'll begin with Folio 16 and with the recommendation to our trustees uh, that the Waterloo Region District School Board approve the name Hillside Public School from the following shortlisted names for the renaming of the elementary school on 11 Chopin Drive in Kitchener. The three shortlisted names are found here, Hillside, Elm Public School, and Evans Public School. Recognizing that our trustees did in fact receive this package, I will make my way through the board report touching on some key elements that we would like to reinforce for you and not read word for word, that's okay. Uh, the renaming committee uh, for 11 Chopin Drive reviewed suggestions received through two rounds of public consultation and has shortlisted the following names. So in addition to the three that we have put forward, Hillside, Elm, and Evans, we also had forward Monarch Woods or Monarch Heights in addition to Emerald, sorry, Emerald Public School. And the descriptors and characteristics and rationale as to why are also found there. The full list of names that were suggested by our students, staff, and community consultation are also found on Appendix A, which is your folio 20 for your review. 
So for context, the school renaming committee identified Hillside Public School as its preferred choice. The name Hillside connects to the community neighborhood. The school is located on a modest hill and incorporates a surrounding street name. When the short list of names was presented to the community, Hillside received the most popularity, especially among the student population. The committee would, in fact, like to note that Monarch Woods, Monarch Heights received considerable momentum from the community as well, and some members of the and, the, and some members of the renaming committee. However, after further consultation with the committee and discussion, some members of the committee did not believe that Monarch Woods, Monarch Heights, as well as Emerald aligned with board policy 4020, renaming and naming of board facilities, and thus was not put forward for recommendation this evening. As a bit of a background, a school provides a focal point for a community. School names typically reflect the community they serve or nearby geographical or historical characteristics. As such, seeking input from the public offers the opportunity to engage with the community in the process of this renaming and an understanding of the rationale and history that prompted the renaming of this school. At every opportunity throughout this process and during the consultation, there was wide consulta consultation and a feedback loop with the school community and the committee communicated the reasons and rationale for renaming as referenced through our board policy and our administrative procedures. The committee met virtually over a series of months to plan the consultation, the screening and decision-making process. During the month of February, uh, the, com the committee asked community members to submit their suggestions on the remaining names, and the committee received hundreds of responses and 82 renaming suggestions. Following again, board policy 4020 and our procedures, the committee reduced the responses to a short list of six names to be considered. Again, recognizing that that feedback loop is critical for our community, uh, the, uh, the recommendations received from the community on February 14th to the 28th from students and staff of 11 Chopin Drive had the opportunity to indicate their preference with over 60% of students and staff participating in the process and 324 responses from all community stakeholders. The committee does believe that its recommendation is aligned and reflective with this consultation process in addition to our policies and procedures. Finally, the committee met again to review that feedback and determine that full recommendation going forward. The committee that I'm referencing here for the renaming of 11 Chopin is in fact listed here below on uh, folio 18. At the top of folio 19, uh, we've extracted details of the renaming process to ensure that our names facilities, the names that we are now proceeding with selecting for our schools are, are in accordance with the following expectations, and those expectations are listed below for your review and uh, reference. Financial implications um, will require changes to signage throughout the school, external to the school, in addition to any mascots, team uniforms, other signages, or references to the previous name will be required. So a combination of school budgets and capital budgets will be leveraged to help facilitate this process over the next few months. For communication, uh, once this name, uh, Hillside Public School, is received and approved by the board here this evening. We will work to inform our WRDS community of the new name online and through social media, and uh, definitely using the support of our communications department going forward as well. If I may proceed with the uh, recommendation for the next one, and then I will turn it over to my colleague to offer additional thoughts, um, and then we're happy to proceed into questions as well. So you're going to do the renaming of Ryerson now? Correct. Okay. So I'd like to draw your attention now to Folio 21. Where's Matt Girard? I want to lower the it was so high. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
I know. <laughs> I should be comfortable. Okay. Uh, so again, it is our recommendation to the board um, that you that uh, the Water of the Region District School Board approve the name Blue Heron Public School from the following shortlisted names for the renaming of the elementary school at 749 Grand Valley Drive in Cambridge. The names that were shortlisted and have been shared with you here this evening, in addition to Blue Heron, are Maple View, Marshland, and Willow River. Again, the renaming committee, much like the process that was uh, undergone to rename um, A.R. Kaufman, uh, also reviewed a, a variety of names that were put forward and through two rounds of public consultation and shortlisted these following names. So again, Blue Heron, Maple View, Marshland, and Willow River and the rationale and descriptors are provided there for you. Also, as in the previous report, a full list of the names that were received uh, are found on Appendix A, so Folio 25. Again, the context for this committee in renaming, um, the naming committee identified Blue Heron Public School as its preferred choice. The connections to both community neighborhood and the natural world through the connection to the Grand River in Cambridge will offer students an opportunity to learn about, connect with, and develop deep respect for both the natural world and natural habitat in their neighborhood. Students will have an opportunity to learn about the importance of each one of us as individuals and as community members to, um, to work towards being good citizens in the environment and within the neighborhood. Again, the background is found uh, below on Folio 22, which is similar to the background provided for the other board report, but really wanting to highlight, um, again, the feedback loop that was provided through the community, uh, back through to the committee on repeated occasions. The committee had five virtual meetings, and they're listed there for your um, consideration as you contemplate this approval. And again, the work done within those committee meetings was certainly to plan, to consult, to screen, to work through an extensive decision-making process while ensuring feedback was given and received by all consulted stakeholders. Throughout the month of February, we asked the community members to also suggest, suggest names for the renaming. We reviewed more than 34 responses and 17 names met our criteria as outlined in our policy and procedures and put forward for the committee's consideration. Again, once that shortlist was provided, we went back to our community throughout the month of March uh, to receive feedback from the broader community as well. And we had over 90% of students of the student and staff population participate in this renaming process with 109 responses. The committee believes its recommendation is aligned with and reflective of this consultation process. Committee net members uh, for this committee are listed below. And I'd also like to highlight the work of Trustee Carla Johnson and, Car and Trustee Scott Piatkowski. I'd also like to highlight the work, of course, of Trust uh, Chairperson Weston and Trustee Ramsey, who supported the work of the A.R. Kaufman renaming committee as well. Again, at the bottom of Folio 23, you will see where we are in line with the expectations of the policy and procedures of the board while reviewing the criteria uh, that must be adhered to when we consider names for, for renaming and naming of our facilities. Financial implications are exactly the same as they are for the previous report, as are the communications. I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague, Superintendent Hill to provide some additional reflections, thoughts, and next steps for us as a district. So at this point, we have used our new process and administrative procedure to complete the naming of one new board facility and the renaming processes of the three facilities approved by the board. Uh, we're reminded that we're guided in our work by the board's commitment to promote Indigenous education, equity, and human rights, inclusive learning and working environments for all students and staff, as has been stated in our board's naming and renaming policy. What we have come to learn through these naming and renaming exercises is that our best effort at designing a process that honors this commitment may not have worked in practice as well as it did in design. <laughs> Oh, pardon me. As a learning organization, we have been committed to listening to and collecting feedback and insights from each of these committee processes and from committee members so that we might iterate and refine our processes in ways that improve our outcomes. 
as we have concluded our initial round of naming and renaming, we have come to understand there are places in the procedures where we could be more explicit, places where we might need to be less explicit, and room for the creation of parallel processes that help us arrive in more consensus-driven ways at names we can all be proud of. We know that the name, sorry. We know that the name of a school should be supported by the school community and should provide opportunities for students, parents, caregivers, and families, and community members to be inspired to learn and to engage and promote belonging and building a sense of community. And it is our belief that taking the time at this point through these first processes to refine the process by which we arrive at a name is a way to ensure that that support and continued inspiration to learn continue. And that, that's your report? Okay, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, trustees, even though the reports were presented together, we are gonna deal with these separately. So on folio 16, there is a uh, recommendation that the Waterloo Region District School Board approve the name Hillside Public School from the shortlisted names for the renaming of the elementary school at 11 Chopin Drive, Kitchener, Ontario. Would someone like to move that motion? Moved by Trustee Radlin, seconded by Trustee Johnson. Okay, uh, any questions or comments? Trustee Ramsey? Thank you, uh, Chair, and um, I want to thank the uh, superintendents for the, uh, um, their work um, on the, uh, the committee. Um, full disclosure, I think most people are aware that um, I am a former student of um, of Eric Hoffman in the public school. It's the first school I attended when I arrived in this um, country. That said, I um, also fully recognize that um, uh, Mr. Kaufman, um, just some brief information, was honored in uh, 1976 by Planned Parenthood of Ontario for his work in advancing access to birth control and family planning services. Mr. Kaufman was a member of the Waterloo Region Hall of Fame, or is a member of the Waterloo Region Hall of Fame. In 1973, it was when Eric Hoffman Public School was named in his honor. I learned that Eric Hoffman just after that. And so I say this, uh, and also have to reflect on Mr. Kaufman's uh, contribution uh, to this community and to the lives of many um, families that I grew up with in one region um, that had work and worked in his um, plant at the corner of um, King and Victoria Streets. So I don't think that can go unrecognized. That said, um, I must state that I'm somewhat disappointed with the, uh, I'm actually really disappointed with the process that led up to um, the development of the school renaming policy. As a member of the uh, committee, I asked for um, the report that was paid for by taxpayers um, to better inform me as to what was taking place on the committee. And that was refused. That's fine. Because you know what, that battle was uh, lost um, last year. So that said, I also fully recognize and believe um, the administrators of uh, Eric Hoffman, the current administrators, when they said that um, the um, kids, the, the current attendees of the school, um, were very excited um, with the um, that was uh, chosen for the school that was announced at an assembly. And I had also had to reflect on the fact that. Um, uh, these were um, uh, a certain amount of expectation was um, created um, within the, uh, the school that this is going to happen. And so for that reason, even though I'm not fond of the process that led up to the decision to change the name and not fond of the fact that um, it was denied access to that secret report that informed the decision to rename the school, I don't wish to uh, disappoint um, the school population. And so I will be supporting um, the, uh, the renaming. And if only it will get us back 
to be able to marshal the same resources that we marshaled to talk about renaming a school. I mean, the name wasn't jumping over the school preventing student learning and achievement, but if it will get us back to the conversations that we should be having uh, and not be distracted by side issues instead of focusing on student learning and achievement. And I think Bill 98 is so timely to fix this. So that said, I will um, support the, uh, the, the renaming, and I hope this is the last of it and that we don't continue to get sidetracked from what the main function as a board is, and that is student learning and achievement. This is distracting, and I hope to just be done with this. Um, the flawed process started last year. It continues now, and I hope it stops here with this renaming, and we just get back to student learning and achievement. I might have some more things to say. I'll hold on. Here are others. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Watson. Trustee Watson. Oh, okay. thank you. Um, through you to Zach. So, um, how did you, as a committee, come to the short list? And you did. You did mention that Monarch and Emerald were, although it was on the short list, it wasn't. They weren't considered. Is that what I heard you say? Okay. So if you could let us know why. So uh, through the chair to Trustee Watson, thank you for your question. Uh, the first part of the question was really around the process piece and how we went about taking the list of names to a short list, to a group of shortlisted names. Uh, we, we took that list to the community, in fact, and we received feedback from our community around the shortlisting of the names and where we heard the unanimous applause from students was where we heard from students who took the, the broader list of, I think, 17 names, and we brought it down to those five. That's where Hillside was certainly emerging as, as a favorite uh, amongst the student population. So that was done by that recurs recursive feedback loop that we've been sharing in both reports in terms of taking names, coming back, continuing to receive that feedback back um, and then working through that process as a committee. The five names that we did bring forward um, through the renaming of, of Eleven Chopin was in fact through our discussions um, as a committee and sincere and significant reflections of our procedures um, that clearly state that we have a commitment um, and an obligation to rename our schools through the lens of our uh, continued commitment to human rights and equity, in addition to upholding the expectations of truth and reconciliation, particularly calls, um, calls to action 62 and 63 that are really um, ensuring that we are not continuing to perpetuate or cause any future or further harm to indigenous communities um, in the region and beyond. Follow up, Trustee Watson, or no? No, I okay. Thank you, Trustee Woodcock. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I just wanna thank the committee for the work that they, all the members of the committee for participating. It's, uh, it's, great. it's It can take a lot of time and a lot of reflection and a lot of thinking. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about the name. And I just want to um, reiterate, I wanna thank staff Krista or Superintendent Hill for um, acknowledging that once we're through these uh, processes, uh, we're going to tweak the board, um, the board approved policy, and um, we learn. We continue to learn, as as Superintendent Hill said. Um, in theory, it. Maybe in practice, it doesn't always work work out when you're when you uh, when you design the process. So I'm glad we're going to debrief on that and have a little um, a, a opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you. I support the recommendation. It's great. Student Trustee Sor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, I would just like to thank everyone who participated in this committee and for the work that happened and was put into this. This is really important work. And um, as someone who has seen the process of um, being on a school renaming committee, um, there's a lot of 
thought and effort and time that's put into this process. And so I think everyone who was a part of it and genuinely, I believe that a key element of student education and success in the classroom is for students to feel like they are safe and that they belong in the school that they are learning. So thank you so much for these efforts and really putting student um, belonging front and center in education. Thank you. Thank you. And I will just add my thanks to the committee and all the community members who submitted names. Um, I was on the committee and I loved hearing that the name Hillside came because the kids love to hang out on the hill. So it brought joy, it brought connection to, uh, you know, joy of going to school and connection to nature. And um, I understand that they're going to be very excited if uh, the trustees approve the name Hillside. So from the school principal. So um, just wanted to add that and thank um, everyone who worked on this process. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Trustee Cody. Yeah, I just Cody? one quick question. Yep. What brought on the name change? It's like, uh, I'm just new, so mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, it sounded like a perfectly good name. He was a well-respected person in the community. Why are why are we just all of a sudden changing names? Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, yeah. Trustee, or uh, Superintendent Hill. Uh, through the chair to respond to the trustee, uh, there was a significant process uh, in the previous uh, board to identify names that some students would not feel a sense of welcome and belonging. Um, and so the, there was an environmental scan done of existing names and of um, especially where schools are named after individuals, where that individual's legacy at a moment in time uh, may have represented one thing, but as we've moved forward, we've understood their legacy to mean something different uh, and that those learning environments may not um, create a sense of belonging for all students. And so in order to create the most inclusive learning environments possible, three schools with particular names were brought forward to the Board of Trustees and the Board of Trustees approved renaming procedures for those three schools. Follow-up, uh, follow trustee yeah. Cody? Whose decision is it to change history and remove somebody's name from history? Because certain groups don't like this person's name. I, I think it's a really big expense, a lot of time wasted on a name. It's not going to improve the physical building structure. It's not going to physically improve the student's learning. Um, I think it's a, it's a horrible waste of time. And a whole expense of money and coming out of the school's capital budget to change uniforms to change letterhead to change signs i i just the money could be well spent on somebody something else rather than taking somebody's name off a history book because of few people and i'll just i'll just mention i'll push it over i'll direct it to uh director chanaka but uh the board and staff are following a board motion that was passed and ratified well, uh, in the previous board. It was board. before my time. On it, it was. I, so I just, yeah, I'm letting well, you know that passion. that was a previous board's decision that is now our decision, and they're uh, acting on that. Director Chenica? Uh, uh, through Chair uh, to Trustee Cody, um, with regards to uh, the impact of the name, I think is really important. There's significant research that talks about children's sense of belonging and their ability to actually perform in school. So the ability to um, actually do well in terms of literacy and numeracy um, and being in a school that's named after someone uh, who from those same communities are perceived to be harmful. And so part of uh, what uh, Superintendent Hill was uh, speaking to was the fact that as we grow and as we know more, we want to be able to do better. And if it is that uh, children um, could be coming to school and feeling harmed or not even feeling safe to even come there, and we've had families and staff who've, uh, staff, families and students who've referenced that to us, um, then our responsibility would be to make sure that they could so that when they come to school, they would feel that sense of belonging and be able 
uh, to learn. And so as part of our responsibility as staff to follow the motion, that was what we did. And um, while respectfully, I could understand that there are uh, considerations around finances, um, I think this is where um, as a board, we put well-being of, of children first to make sure that they can actually perform well in a school where they don't feel um, uh, unsafe. Okay. Sorry, before I come to you, Trustee Watson, I noticed it's five, it's not 5.30, it's 9.30. Um, can I get a motion to extend? Moved by Trustee Watson, seconded by Trustee Woodcock. All in favor? Okay, thank you. That's unanimous and carried. Okay, Trustee Watson. Thank you. Through you to staff. So um, just to follow up to Trustee Cody's question, um, you mentioned environmental scan. Are there other schools on a list that will come forward to this board? Is, th is this it with your environmental scan or there are other schools that we can expect to review their name uh just wondering if this is it or if this is something coming in the near future with other names within the school board superintendent Hill. no i won't uh, through the chair to respond to the trustee i won't speak with absolute authority on this but if i remember the process correctly um the board identified the first three schools and then there's a process within the policy if uh, a name emerges from the community then the environmental scan can confirm what the community member is bringing forward and the Board of Trustees can uh, approve whether or not other renaming processes should follow, if that, I remember correctly. That's my understanding also. Yeah. So just to follow, follow up, follow up. So there's, nothing, there's nothing currently, okay. No. Okay, seeing no further questions, there is a recommendation on Folio 16 to rename uh, the school, the elementary school at 11 Chopin Drive. Uh, Hillside Public School. All in favor? Okay, thank you. And opposed? Thank you. And that motion is carried. Thank you. Okay. And now we will move to the renaming of Ryerson Public School, which is on Folio 21. There. Uh, that the Waterloo Region District School Board approved the name Blue Heron Public School from the following shortlisted names from the renaming of the elementary school at 749 Grand Valley Drive, Cambridge, Ontario. Would someone like to move that motion? Moved by Trustee Radland, seconded by Trustee Piotowski. Okay, would anyone like to speak to this one? Uh, Trustee Watson. Thank you. So, um, and I'm not sure if you just didn't want to repeat some of the same things from the, the previous report, but I didn't really hear a lot about um, uh, student involvement in this. And so I'm just wondering um, how those names uh, came to be. Like, were those the, you know, is that a complete list of all of the uh, names that were submitted and are these the five that had the highest amount of vote okay and i guess i just want to hear more about um why the students and you know because you talked about 60 percent with the hillside i wanted to hear more information about how the students uh, came to choose this name Wonderful. Well, so thanks you know, through the chair to yeah. Trustee Watson. Thank you for the question. So you are right that the names that we um, were in fact working through are the ones found in Appendix A on Folio 25 for the renaming of 749 uh, Grand Valley Drive. Uh, through that process, we did continue to loop back to our community, to students, to staff, and to our broader uh, school community, both families and in addition to neighboring community members as well. So there was a significant effort on the part of staff through signage externally to elicit neighborhood community members who don't necessarily have children even at the school, but by virtue of being in proximity of the school also participated. 
Uh, I was not intentional in omitting that section around the students' um, contributions. And if you will note on uh, Folio 23, I did, I think, mention uh, that we had 90% of student staff participating in the process to name the school and to recommend um, uh, the name um, going forward. We were working with the number 109 responses. And as we unpack that a little bit further, juxtaposing that to the 90%, what was being identified by the staff was the class voting. So teachers took it upon themselves to work with their class, in some cases, kindergarten, grade one, as opposed to having them individually vote, the, the classroom was engaging in that as a learning opportunity as well. While the processes were quite similar in terms of its, its structure and format, the way in which it actually played out in both of the sites differed subtly based on the context of each of the unique school communities and the leaders and staff as they proceeded to um, work with their students and families to select that name. Uh, so I, I, we, we continue, I'd like to just reinforce that number of 90% in terms of that work that we were doing, um, both with students and staff to work through the names that were put forward. We uh, wanted to also acknowledge that the names that were put forward were uh, supported uh, beyond students as well, but through this, and again, just want to highlight the students, the staff, uh, the families and caregivers, in addition to the broader community, all having a participant say. And of course, the work of the committee that came together repeatedly to review, um, to seek feedback, uh, to look at those submissions and to continue to plan forward. Thank you, Trustee, Trustee Piotrowski. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, I, I wanted to uh, share um, my pleasure at being involved in the uh, the process of, of choosing a new name for uh, for this school and uh, and how happy I am with the, uh, the name Blue Heron. I wanted to uh, commend Superintendent Giannopoulos for her leadership of the process and uh, Principal Moskelt Mos as well. Um, I do think that uh, that the process uh, could be improved. I think that uh, there was acknowledgement through the uh, the process that the next time we name a school or rename a school that uh, that there needs to be more time taken for meaningful consultation, particularly with local indigenous communities. and um, and I want to uh, commit to uh, making sure that that does take place uh, for future naming, uh, but I'm very happy to uh, to vote for the name Blue Heron for uh, for this school. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Trustee Johnson. Thank you. I just want to say, as a member of the committee, I this was fascinating and enjoyable on every level. I had no idea going into this what it would mean. I was curious about the process. And um, so I want to thank you for your patience dealing with all of us in the process, too, as we had lots of questions and lots of what ifs and that along the way. And uh, uh, this, the school community who was so heavily engaged and it was really wonderful to see how involved the teachers were, the administration and the students, there were really a strong sense of community around coming up, uh, the renaming of the school. And as a Cambridge trustee, the, the, the one Cambridge trustee was on this committee was a real honor to be a part of it. And I can certainly say with confidence, no one's name has been removed from history, that name of phantom history, but we are able to name the school something that is embracing of the larger community that we can be, we can be very proud and honored. And we took the time to think about the name. We took the time and the effort to really ponder what name really brings the community together and all the elements therein. So I just want to say thank you to everyone, and I'm very delighted to support this new name. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions, uh, there is a uh, the motion on Folio 21 has been moved and seconded to rename the elementary school at 749 Grand Valley Drive, Cambridge, to Blue Heron Public School. All in favor? Okay, thank you. And opposed? And that motion is carried. Thank you, Superintendent Giannopoulos and Hill. All right. 
the time. We are moving on to folio 26, motion request for report on ebook surveys and curriculum. Uh, Trustee Watson, would you like to move that motion? Okay, thank you. Would somebody like to second it? Okay, thank you. And Trustee Watson, would you like to speak to it? Sure, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to start by saying all students belong and are welcome at uh, the Waterloo Region District School Board. After listening to delegations a few weeks ago and tonight, it's clear there's much confusion and inaccurate information. This motion isn't about banning books or sexual identities or the right or the left. This motion is about listening to parents who have legitimate concerns about age appropriateness and providing them with the information about their concerns in the form of a report. Sexual health and age appropriateness are highly charged topics that have been the subject of parental concerns for decades. And if the concept of age appropriateness is being eliminated, that information needs to be shared with the public. Today, age appropriateness is quickly being mischaracterized into something it isn't. And this strategy first discredits the legitimate concern of parents and then absolves elected officials of any responsibility to act on that concern. When it comes to sexual health teaching in its various forms, parents want more information, notice, and opt-out information. This motion is asking for a public report that will provide parents with transparent information and making boards accountable because they're answering the questions and concerns of parents. Parents are questioning why they get several emails about EQAO, a signed permission uh, slip for health class, when some parents don't get that signed permission slip, and permission to play on a, a climber, but didn't hear about a 22-page questionnaire asking about their children's gender, mental health, status, and sexuality. Many parents support sexual health teaching, but want it to be age appropriate. Parents have been complaining about sexual health te teaching in its various forms, whether it's survey or play or presentations or discussions, and are concerned that their children are being inundated with sexual health information. Parents have also sh shared that this that this board that their at this particular board their children are able to access books in the virtual library that aren't age appropriate. Recently, three parents came to the board with this concern, but the majority of trustees voted against forwarding their concerns to staff. We need to start addressing parental concerns. This board did have a history of addressing age appropriate concerns. In 2016, a former board approved a motion concerning graduated filtering according to grade level for Chromebooks. The younger the grade, the stronger the filter. And according to the board website under internet filtering, it states all students, staff, and anyone accessing the internet through a WRDSB network will have their results filtered through a firewall. So why wouldn't we want an age appropriate filtering process in our virtual libraries? The Ministry of Education mandates age appropriateness within the sexual health guidelines, starting with grade one to 12. Parents must also give signed permission for sexual health teaching, or they could also opt out under the board ministry mandated religious accommodation policy. The Ministry of Education mandates age appropriateness. Parents want to know why the Ministry of Education mandates age appropriateness for sexual health in the classroom, but not in the virtual library. What makes the virtual library different from the classroom? Parents are confused and believe that there's a double standard. Voting down this motion further drives a wedge between parents and the board and still does not address their legitimate concerns and questions and does nothing to build confidence but only heighten more suspicion. With the recent announcement of the Ministry of Education improving accountability and transparency in Ontario schools, one of their news releases stated consistency in the classroom experience is vital to ensure that no matter where one lives, a student is getting the education they need to master important lifelong skills like reading, writing, and math. There's more, but because of time, it goes, goes on to say that the same can be said for parents when it comes to knowing what is happening in their child or ch children's classroom. It also states strengthening parent 
parental involvement by authorizing the minister requires school boards to provide parent-friendly information about their child's education so they can have the information they need at the their fingertips to support their children. And this is especially true for sexual health teaching. Voting for this motion will send a signal to our community that we're willing to start addressing the concerns of all parents without exception. So I'll be supporting this motion and I would hope that my colleagues would support this information to uh, this motion to bring more information to the board uh, and to address the concerns of parents. Thank you. Would someone else like to speak to this motion? Trustee Radler. Uh, so through you, through the chair, um, the motion uh, speaks to ebooks and it also asks that the report include the process by which parents are provided with information, etc. And um, I went on the board website and I saw that there's Administrative Procedure 1238, which is exemption from instruction related to the human development and sexual health expectations. It's a detailed procedure in terms of the role of the principal, the teacher, the parent in how parents um, opt out of any sec um, sexual health classes that they don't want their kids to participate in. Um, if a school does not follow that procedure, there is another administrative procedure that for parent support that details how parents address that concern with the board. So I guess my question is, um, the process is available on the website. I'm not clear why we need a report on procedures that exist on the website. And, and um, also in terms of, you know, the surveys and so on. So there is an existing procedure. Um, so, yeah, I guess I don't understand why we have the report. If that's available, it's, it's right there on the website. Are you asking that we let parents know the link or what's the purpose in terms of um, opting out notice? Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, Trustee Redmond, just you want okay. for clarification on that section of her motion. I'm just making sure she's finished her question. Trustee Watson, okay, you would like uh, to answer the purpose? So the report um, uh, was precipitated by the fact that parents were coming forward talking about e-books and how their younger children were able to access books of an older like grade. Um, but some parents that contacted me um, weren't aware of this information. They weren't aware um, that, um, that they could, under religious accommodation, opt out. They weren't. Some parents didn't get information about the survey. Some parents didn't even get a letter about the sexual health unit. So this would clarify, uh, you know, uh, for for parents, this is the information that um, we want to provide for you for transparency and accountability. So you have all of the information and, and parents want to know, is this virtual library filtered in any way or or not and and why not okay Radlin, do you have a follow-up or well to you chair my question hasn't been answered i think the ebook question about filter is one part of your of the motion the second part asks for report on procedures that are available on the website so i'm addressing that and wondering i don't understand the purpose of that request since that information is already available to parents okay so trustee I'll, watson I'll try again thank you so some parents aren't aware they aren't aware of the administrative procedures and so when they we when they do call they would like some transparency they they want this information to be <clears throat> presented together so that they understand 
what what we're providing and um, what what they're able to do, whether it's to opt out or whether it's to to get more information about um, what's happening in the virtual library, um, why they didn't receive um, a, a slip or notice for the survey. So it, it really is about addressing a lot of the concerns that I've been hearing or emails we've been receiving. It really is a report to address those and provide all the information in one, one report. Student Trustee Sora. Thank you, Madam Chair. Am I able to speak to the motion? Yes, we're speaking to okay. the motion. Yes, thank you. Through you, um, I'd like to begin by saying that while I would vote for standardized access between physical and digital libraries for WRDSB students, I note the possible associated costs of updating and maintaining our digital infrastructure. I also note that an elementary student with unsupervised access to their school's library books from home is very likely to also have access via other online means to the same titles alongside much more concerning ones. I recall as well that my elementary school used to send me home with a notice to my parents prior to starting each sexual education unit. This was also the case for my younger brother and most of the students that I asked who still had a memory of that time. And when I asked my parents, they noted that if we hadn't handed them the notices, they wouldn't have known. So perhaps a more direct way to communicate such notices to parents is indeed beneficial. On another note though, I take concern with this motion implying that parents should require advance notice for each and every survey made by the board, as I note the potential risk for vulnerable students in unsafe households when it comes to surveys dealing with sensitive subject matters. Perhaps the answer is not to pass parenting duties to the school board, but to have the challenging discussions at home instead of worrying about how students might answer a question about their preferred pronouns outside the confinement of their households. Now, I was once called a groomer for pointing out um, the misinformation and, mis and embellishment in one of the most prominent sources that was fueling attacks on the student LGBTQ plus community following the last time the board discussed library books. Perhaps it was by someone so blinded by bigotry and hate to notice that they were in fact addressing a minor. Yet it serves as a testament to how easily such discussions can be weaponized. Thus, I implore everyone contributing to this discussion in the board and in the community to tread lightly in order to um, not to, despite best intentions, inflict more harm than whatever is meant to be averted. And finally, as a student body representative, I would like to remind everybody that the student body watches our board meetings and that we pay close attention to things that the grown-ups say here and elsewhere when it has direct influence on each and every one of us, especially the most vulnerable amongst us. And as a result, I will be voting against this motion in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you, student trustee Sorar. Uh, trustee Piotrowski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too will be voting against this uh, this motion, and I'm uh, going to um, actually quote from a National Post article from October 2021 uh, to uh, to explain why. And oddly enough, it it actually quotes the mover and seconder of of this motion. Uh, people have a huge connection to literature. Some people are concerned this is going to be a book banning, trustee Cindy Watson said in an interview. The concern from what I've been hearing is that books will just go away and then no one will ever know. They don't know what the framework is. I don't know what that framework is. I don't know what the process is. And I don't know if it will include students or parents or community members or whether there will be any consultations. Trustee Mike Ramsey said that he is concerned that censoring or book burning is being done under the cover of human rights and equity. Um, my concern is that the criteria for banning books uh, comes only from staff being informed by a select few. So I'm trying to, we've been discussing this issue um, for over a year and a half. Uh, we've debated it, we've had staff reports uh, I think that the, the process has been made clear. Um, 
I'm not sure how trustees go from saying what was quoted in that article to moving and seconding this motion, um, but I'm certainly not going to vote for it. Thank you, Trustee Meisner. Um, thank you, Chair, to Trustee Watts. And I'm just, there's a couple of things I need to understand in order to, to fully take in this, this motion. The, there was two recitals. Uh, one was elementary students able to access ebooks, and I would assume that's in the library. And the second recital talks about the idea that some parents state they're not receiving notice or output information for sexual health teaching. And that seems to be curriculum. How do the two tie together? How, how is it that you want to tie these together? Is it, our, is it a concern that elementary students are having access to books about sex in the library? Is that what the concern is? Trustee Watson? So um, obviously the concern is that it's, it, the concern is age appropriate. It, the concern is not about banning a book. The concern is that just like we looked at filtering for computers, we would look at what are we gonna do with the virtual library so that students aren't able to access material that is above their, their age or their grade. So when we look at this whole motion, I kept hearing from parents who were talking about um, not getting notice for surveys, not hearing about a play when it's being presented, not hearing, uh, not getting a form home. Uh, about sexual health teaching. And so really, uh, this is about providing clarity to parents, providing information. It's a report. I'm not asking to change any policy or develop new policy. I'm asking that we would just ask staff to, to come to explain the process, explain about the virtual library, explain about, you know, all of the things that are mentioned in the motion so that parents have detailed information and they don't have to go hunting around for administrative procedures on the website. I just think in, in, the, in the name of transparency and accountability, we would just answer those questions and provide information, provide the links, provide uh, the information that, that parents are looking for and that we would answer their questions and concerns. That, that's simply it. Follow up, Trustee Meisner. And again, I understand what you're saying, that you would like transparency for families, but, but I'm not seeing how this ties from the curriculum to the idea of choosing books in the library. Are you suggesting that the curriculum is not age appropriate? Because that, that's something that a parent, of course, has the option to opt out of. We see that, that we, they do have it. It's actually in the, uh, the um, policy. I'm not sure how the two tie together in your recital. Trustee Watson. Thank you. So um, are you talking about when I talked about the curriculum guidelines within my presentation? No, I'm talking about what the two recitals are in your motion. One has to do with elementary students able to access ebooks right. that are not age appropriate. And so the second paragraph talks Trust about some of the other issues that parents have, and it would be bonus, <clears throat> and it would be uh, surveys coming and them not knowing about the surveys, mm. or not understanding the context behind the surveys, or um, not receiving the the slip uh, that they they receive before sexual health. Um, so so basically, it's and I you know these are concerns that I've heard from parents, and they want answers and questions and I thought wouldn't it be great if we just had a report and we could answer all these questions for parents and answer their concerns. Okay. Trustee Woodcock. Thank you through you Madam Chair. Um, speaking to the motion, uh, the first paragraph in the motion, um, I, I feel that we have um, We've had presentations from library staff, we've had publishers, we've had reps from um, library associations explaining the process of how books are, um, are determined to be in, in our libraries online and in physical libraries. And I, um, I have every confidence in the professionalism and the expertise of staff to be able to 
uh, make sure that the um, that the the collection is properly maintained and properly uh, vetted. Uh, speaking to the second part of the motion, which is is different, I'm um, uh, there. Uh, Trustee Radland has already referred to the procedure uh, where parents can. Um, under faith and religious accommodations, they can um, pursue uh, opting out of various um, pieces of the curriculum. So uh, I, I think that we have already answered these and I'll be voting uh, against this. One last thing, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'm still reflecting on the words of our of student trustee Soar that, um, in this conversation, and uh, I, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm, I'm landing on this motion. Okay, thank you, um, trustees. I am noticing the time again. It is ten o'clock. Can I have a motion to extend to ten thirty? Moved by Trustee Woodcock, seconded by Trustee Watson. All in favor? Okay, and opposed. And that motion is carried. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I have. Uh, Trustee Ramsey. Thank you, Chair. Being mindful of the, uh, the time, I think uh, my colleague Trustee Watson covered the topic well. And I just um, wanted to point out uh, just uh, maybe one or two uh, inconsistencies. Um, one of my trustee colleagues I have mentioned about uh, a National Post um, article. And interestingly enough, um, Trustee Watson and I, what we were discussing was the fact that we were against censorship uh, book bans. At the end of the day, what it comes down to this motion, what this motion is really about, and I think many are trying to reframe this as that um, we are trying to, um, to ban books and so forth. I'm far away from banning books. What this is about is age appropriateness. And I think that uh, Trustee Watson made, made it very, very clear, abundantly clear that that's what the discussion is. But my colleagues don't want the discussion to be about that. It's, they want it to be about other peripheral issues that actually Bill 98 is um, able. Trustee Ramsey, please don't infer what people are thinking. Well, it's not no. infer. Well, my colleague, Madam Chair, well, then the same rule should have applied to Trustee Piakowski when he suggested that we we're talking about book bans. In fact, I could give some concrete examples of people that were actually advocating book bans that um, this board listen to, and I listen to, out of respect uh, for the fact that they could come as, as uh, citizens and speak. So that said, I, I think it's quite appropriate that the ministry now looking at directing school boards to increase in engagement and reporting to parents on student achievement and ensuring parents have easy access to the information that they need to meaningfully engage with their children's education and success. For me, it's not word for word in that motion, but that what that's what this motion is about. And this is this is the direction that education is going in finally in, in, in Ontario. That said, I've heard talk about um, people being called groomers. Yeah, I've heard people being called groomers. I've been called a white supremacist for, for some of the things that I've said with respect to um, student learning and achievement. And for that, I was called a white supremacist by people that supported many of my colleagues around this table. And you know what? That is their democratic right. I would not ask to shut them up. So when parents come and we try to belittle them and call them transphobe for simply asking to say, well, you know what? Is this age appropriate? That's what this is about. That's what this motion is about. And if, I mean, trustees can vote against it if they want. Obviously, they have that right. And then, you know, we will legislate some things and respect, looking at respecting our parental rights. So I will be supporting the motion. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens in the next um, couple of months. I just hope that um, uh, Mr. Lachey follows through with the lady. Trustee Radlin. Thank you, Sue Yuch. I do acknowledge the concern of parents who say they are not getting information. I do, however, know, hear from parents who are getting the information. 
So it seems to me that the issue is one that should be addressed if there's a parent whose school is not following the procedure of sending information, then that should be addressed at the school level because this is not happening throughout the board. There are many parents who are receiving that. And so it may be some lapse um, in terms of individual schools. The other thing is information is you don't need to search for an administrative procedure. I just searched for consent forms and, and the forms came up. In terms of um, libraries, again, we are acknowledging the fact that parents have the right to be involved in their children's education. But it is also true that we have to acknowledge that there are publishers, there are librarians, there are people who are um, experts in the field of libraries who have determined that it is important that the books that we have in our school libraries are available for different aspects of learning. And our curriculum, which is, um, you know, uh, determined by the ministry, is 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 what drives what are in libraries. As Trustee Sora mentioned, you know, the internet exists, and the, the, there's a lot that's available to children outside of libraries. In school settings. Um, I think that there are filters and controls in terms of make of books that are age appropriate. And I I may be mistaken, but I'm not aware that there is a lot of evidence that students are, you know, going into the e-libraries and online libraries and, and downloading books that they should not be reading. So I do think that. The board does show respect for parental rights. And I think that where parents have individual concerns, there is already a process that exists for them. If they're unhappy with the way their school is communicating, there already is a process that exists for them to address that concern. Thank you, Trustee Meisner. To the chair, to the board. Um, I think I'd be remiss if we didn't mention the three delegates who were here on March 27th who didn't get a chance for us to hear us talking about this particular issue, especially aid appropriateness. James Saunders, who's CEO and publisher of Saunders Books, assured us he is a professional that there is a rigorous selection process and a range of professionals who look at age appropriate resources. Anita Brooks Kirkland, who is from the Canadian School Library, who formerly worked for this board delegated to say that age appropriateness can become a distortion. You need to be careful about that. That there, are, there is a selection based on reason and principle and not on personal preference. These are professional people that are looking out in their best interest, and that does not exclude parents in the least. Parents still have the right to know what their children are reading, but there is age appropriate as a range, as a spectrum, we also had Mike Miller talk about the idea that, you know, what, what his children read in his family isn't necessarily what your children might read, but he has the right for those children to read it if they want. Age appropriate is a challenge. I understand that. But we do have people who go through a rigorous process to make sure that that process is put into place. Families have the right to make sure that their kids are reading. We should have an idea what those kids are reading, but should not exclude other families' children from reading. Thank you. And I will remind the gallery to try to, to keep quiet, please. I, I'm hearing a buzz from the gallery. So thank you. And it's, it is distracting. Trustee Woodcock for uh, the pass. second time. No, I'll pass. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Watson, would you like the, oh, sorry, looking around. Trustee Watson, do you want to wrap up? Yes. Could I, could I ask a question? Um, before I close up, a question of staff? I'm not sure to, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. To. Go ahead, ask the question and I'll refer it. Are our virtual libraries filtered for age appropriateness in any way? Okay. Um, sorry, I can't see. Associate Director Shantz. 
uh, through the chair to trustees, our, our virtual libraries are set up very similar to school libraries or community libraries where there is a range of books uh, that would meet, uh, would be a collection, that it would be the term that we would use. And students would be able to access books within those collections. As we've heard from delegates, as we've heard from the professionals that curate those, those books, students use their interest levels to help pick and select the texts that, uh, that they guide their reading. Uh, I also would like to add in that parents always have the option, if a book comes home, or is signed out that is not deemed uh, something that a parent or a guardian or a caregiver would like to have access to, that can be returned as well and another selection taken. So follow-up, follow-up. Are the virtual libraries filtered? Because we're hearing from parents a grade two is able to access, or grade one, a grade nine book. So is there any sort of filtering in the virtual library besides a child picking a book based on, you know, what, what you just said, based on their interest or whatever? Is there any sort of filtering in the virtual library? Associate Director Sean? Through the chair to trustees, I may be misunderstanding the question, but as I stated before, we have a full range of collections in our, our in our libraries, in our school buildings, and in our virtual buildings as well. So there would be a number of texts that students could walk to and select in a in a brick and mortars library, and similarly in a in an e library as well. There would be a range of texts that they would be able to access. Okay, thank you. So um, I think it's clear. There's okay. no filtering in the virtual library. Just very quickly, please and wrap up. Yes, I, I get five minutes according to our bylaws. Well, you had five minutes earlier, so I'm just asking you to wrap up quickly. And each time you speak. So um, I wanted to just say that I think that that's a real concern that students are able to access any sort of uh, age appropriate book or a book that's not age appropriate. Parents, I believe, have a legitimate concern. We did hear that even, you know, um, when we talk about filtering and age appropriateness, we're talking about that, just recognize that there is no filtering for um, our virtual libraries and that there shouldn't, uh, we should not make parents feel like they're doing something wrong because their expectation is that um, we as the board would be concerned about age appropriateness and, um, so I do want to restate again that this motion isn't about uh, banning books or sexual identities or the right or left. This motion is about listening to parents, answering their questions and concerns. Everything in this motion are concerns that I have heard from parents, whether phone calls, emails, uh, you know, uh, being approached out in public. These are legitimate concerns and, um, you know, to vote against this motion is to to basically say we're not going to address your concerns. Oh, point right. order. No, Thank no. you, no. Trustee Woodcock. Your point of order. order. It's unfortunate that uh, I would really appreciate it if Trustee Watson wouldn't um, imply motivation about though how I vote, and uh, I would ask her to rescind that remark. I sustain that point of uh, order. Will you rescind that? Why don't Reason I word it? Okay, so if we're not going to address the concerns of parents when they're talking about their children accessing, younger children accessing any book within the virtual library, they're going to feel like their concerns and their questions aren't being heard and won't be answered. Okay. Moving to a vote, the motion has been moved on folio 26. The motion has been moved and seconded, and I will be voting. All in favor? Thank you. And opposed? And the motion is defeated. Okay, we're moving on to question period. I'm sure. Trustee Woodcock? A motion to adjourn. Okay. Is there a seconder to adjourn? Trustee Johnson, all in favor of adjourning? Sure.
Opposed? And the motion is carried and this meeting is adjourned.